Yeah, she is a trailblazer. But y'all know that already, right? She's a, trail, a trailblazer, an advocate for change, and a powerful force in the world of healthcare and patient-centric advocacy. With a career dedicated to making a positive impact, Ms. Carmel's journey is nothing short of inspiring. She is the founder and CEO of Tiger Lily Foundation. And, and she founded the organization while in chemotherapy. After being diagnosed in 2006 with stage two breast cancer at just a very young age of 32. Mama found her own lump in her breast. When she went to her providers to report this, she was told that she was too young, right? She was just too young to have breast cancer and to come back in six months, right? After pushing, after pushing for a biopsy, she was diagnosed with hard to treat triple negative breast cancer. Come back in six months? I don't think so. While in chemotherapy, she made a promise to God that if she survived, she would give her life in service to others. So in 2010, she worked to pass the Breast Cancer Early Act with Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Through Tiger Lily Foundation, MEMA is dedicated to changing the lives of young women before, during, and after breast cancer. This is the work she was born to do. As our moderator for the Beacon Symposium, Ms. Carmel will guide us through engaging discussions, thought-provoking conversation, and collaborative initiatives, ensuring that this event is both informative and inspiring. Her presence here today underscores the importance of our shared mission to redefine patient care and health equity. It says, please join me, but she's here. Please join me on stage. <laughs> so, as my, so as Mema leads us through these discussions, let's dive in with open hearts and open minds. Let us co-create, innovate, and inspire. Let us not just talk about change, but become the agents of change. Together, we will chart a course towards health equity, a course that will lead us to brighter, more inclusive, and healthier future. The first panel titled Health Equity with the Patient as the Leader, a Paradigm Shift, brings to the forefront an inspiring concept. Should it be inspiring to put patients first? An inspiring concept. Put them in the driver's seat of their own journey. Joining Mema on stage for the panel are Kawana Rucker. So as I call your names, please come to the stage. Kawana Rucker, a triple positive breast cancer survivor and patient advocate whose diagnosis pushed her, to the, pushed her to embark on a global journey, extensively researching integrative approaches to healing from breast cancer. Over the past two years, Kwana committed herself to supporting fellow cancer patients as a board certified health coach and is actively involved as a Tiger Lily Foundation lead advocate. She passionately is advocating and educating others on how to overcome breast cancer. Keisha Stephanie, come to the stage, please. <laughs> Keisha, a triple negative breast cancer survivor since April 2021. Through faith, family, she found strength and purpose in her journey. Now dedicated to the power of one, Keisha, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother, shares her triumphant story to inspire early detection, empowering others, Joining us from San Francisco Bay Area, she's a passionate advocate in the Tiger Lily Foundation's Angel Advocate Program, collaborating with health professionals and championing breast cancer, breast health education. Dr. Mandy Pratt Chapman, come to the stage. <laughs> Dr. Mandy Pratt Chapman holds positions as an Associate Professor of Medicine and prevention at GW School of Medicine and Milken Institute School of Public Health. 
Her personal mission centers on expanding the accessibility of evidence-based health care and disease prevention strategies, and her research primarily concentrates on patient navigation, cancer survivorship, evidence-based cancer control, and promoting health equity, particularly for intersectional LGBTQ communities. One more for you, maybe two. Lindsay, Lindsay Levingston, come to the stage. <laughs> Lindsay, talk about a tiger lily, right? <laughs> a versatile multimedia professional professor at Montclair State University and a breast cancer survivor. Her impact work spans TV networks like PBS and Fox. Founder of Survive Her, Lindsay raises awareness and empowers women in their breast cancer journey and has earned acclaim from Essence and Oprah and Revolt TV Black News for her work. Pamela Barnes, where are you? <laughs> Pamela. Pamela is from Bristol Myers Squibb. She's the director of Federal Strategic Alliance, a strategic powerhouse. Formerly director of executive branch strategy, Pamela shaped public policy, legislation, and engages with the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. With a rich background at GSK and the federal government, she brings a wealth of experience to our event. Our Brown University and Boston University Medicine alum, Pamela is also a trailblazer in healthcare alliances. So welcome to our panelists. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. 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 Um, Kim, thank you for that lovely, lovely opening. Really appreciate you and your energy and Reverend T. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, for those of you who know me and maybe who may not, know, I think I know pretty much all of you, if not in some distant way. Um, this whole work that we do is really about spirituality and it's about soul. I think we oftentimes get into the science of, of cancer and treating disease that we forget that there's a human being in a body that is um, that God breathed life into, and that's why we're here. And so for me, everything we do, we open up with a prayer, and it, all we do at Tiger Lily is about prayer, and it's about healing, because whatever your journey looks like, you're, you're healing, you're transforming, you're growing throughout the process. Um, when I first heard the words, you have breast cancer, all I heard about was death and dying. You know, you have triple negative breast cancer, you don't have treatment for your body, you're gonna die in five years. There was nobody talking about hope and healing and transformation. So Tiger Lily, the name itself, symbolizes a woman's ability to be more beautiful, more strong and transformed during her breast cancer journey. And I love seeing these beautiful women up here and all of you in the audience because you're all part of this mission to help patients, all of us are patients, to be able to heal, grow and transform throughout their journey. Um, thank you to our sponsors for making this happen. Um, you know, it's so important what we do as patients, but it takes partners to believe in our mission, to fund these things for us to do. Um, and I was telling Janine earlier, Janine, who's our founding sponsor for the event, when we talked last year, I'm like, I have some ideas. I want to do a national 21 city tour. I want to do this and that and the other. And she's like, okay. And it manifested. <laughs> um, if you don't ask, you don't receive. It's the power of prayer. It's believing and faith without works is empty, right? Um, so thank you all. And one of the things that um, Janine and her company and others supported was our angel advocacy program, BMS as well. When I began Tiger Lily, I remember before even beginning, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I mean, we tell our stories, but people don't understand what it feels like to be living your life one day and you feel a lump in your breast and the next, in a couple of weeks, months, someone says you have cancer and you're afraid to be in your own body because it's trying to kill you. That fear is so all encompassing and for a black woman with triple negative breast cancer, um, even other subtypes, you, there's a lack of equity with, with science and research and, and not being seen. And so when I began this work, I was in a terri terrifying place. And I had no one I could talk to. I kept saying, can I get a patient who's my age? We don't know anybody your age. Is there a patient with my subtype? No, not. Is there someone alive I can talk to? No. Is there a patient who looks like me? Black woman, like, no. And so my goal was to figure out a way to build community so that patients, people like you all who are here who are advocates, wouldn't be alone. 
And I love that when I see you all in the room, you're smiling, you're hugging, you're seeing your sisters. Like, that's what I wanted to build. And it actually, it's been seven years in the making and it actually exists. Thanks to our sponsors. And thanks to you all showing up and saying yes to becoming angel advocates. Because of you, our sisters are no longer alone. Um, we embarked on a really important project last year. We wanted to see if you invest in patients, um, in letting, well not letting, we're supposed to be leading, so not letting us lead, but invest in us being leaders in this work, what would happen if they advised, created, and curated, and, and, and designed a program that they wanted to see that work with them, for them, by them. And it's been incredible. Um, BMSF funded us for a two-year grant to be doing the, do the angel lead program. And it was a test to see how, you know, if industry just gave us the money to do the work without saying you do it this way. That's my daughter, she has to wait. Love you. <laughs> she calls it the most inopportune sometimes. Um, what would happen? And so we had five women that we put in the program. Keisha and, and Kawana were part of that program. And many of you were in treatment at the time, active treatment. And people said, why are you gonna pick people who are in treatment to be advocates? But that's when women need the hope the most, when they're feeling that loss and they want that connection and they kicked butt. I mean, you guys made me so proud. So I'll start with the two of you. Um, give them a hand, please. <laughs> um, so Keisha and Kawana, I've, I've been so proud to see you all evolve. I remember when we picked the angel, because we went through over like a couple hundred people that, we, that were applying for the program. And you were all fresh, like fresh off the boat, still in treatment, still struggling, on social media kind of, but just still kind of wobbly like toddlers in your breast cancer journey. And when I see you now, I just want to cry. Like, I see what you're doing. Um, the numbers speak for themselves. Is, um, for those who are in the room, when you get some time, please look at the posters. They show the impact of our work. But can you share what it was like to be a patient? Because you guys literally created the program. We had the idea, but the patient created it. And you guys helped to inform it as a group. Tell me what it was like to be given that kind of, you know, support to do the work. and what it meant for you as a black woman, your community, and your, your living legacy? For me, it was um, very empowering because I was able to not just learn more about my own diagnosis, um, I was able to communicate to those that either, either asked me about my diagnosis or um, as I went into the community and started giving resources and information, I just found that it was so important that everybody understood what breast cancer was and what it does to your body, um, what it does after you're done with treatment, during treatment, um, what it does to you mentally, you know. Um, life, I think a lot of times um, we don't talk about it in the um, black community about being sick or having some type of a you know, disease, especially breast cancer. And um, it's so quiet. And I wanted to be able to put it on the forefront because I thought it was so important. Um, I wanted to make sure people understood of early detection um, was critical um, because it saved my life twice. And um, in order to do that, I had to get the tools because I didn't know how to do that. And you know, going through the cohort, it gave me, it just empowered me with all the information that I needed to go back out into my community and give them that information. And I'm so thankful for that, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, it just Thank had, you for showing <laughs> up. It had me, you know, it helped me not just, um, it just helped me grow as a person. Because when you go through um, a breast cancer diagnosis and as you're going through treatment, you learn so much about yourself. I don't know if anybody, I learned so much about myself. I learned that I'm stronger than what I ever thought that I was and that um, I do have the ability to go out and be this, you know, pioneer for this. You know, unfortunately it was for breast cancer, but um, I can create a legacy um, in making sure that everyone understands that it's not a death sentence. You know, you don't have to be afraid of it. You just take it head on. So that's what I did, I got out of it. There's a quote that I love by Wayne Dyer, and I, somebody asked me earlier like um, about my journey and th did cancer change me? I said, no, it never changed me. The quote says, when you're squeezed, when you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Orange juice. And so when you're squeezed in life, what comes out is who you are. So things don't change you, they bring out the best, or they bring out whatever you are, and they brought out the best in you. So that, I don't think that cancer made us different, it made us rise to the occasion of being our best selves. 
and the work that you're doing has been so incredible. Can you share a bit about what you've been doing in the community? Because you kind of didn't, you know, give yourself your shout out. You just, you do a lot, a lot. <laughs> so can you share a bit about what you've done while going through breast cancer, not one, but two times uh, in yeah. less than a year and a half? Yeah, less than a year and a half. I was diagnosed the second time in February of this year and um, went through treatment again. But during that time, you know, I've been on panels like this, um, sharing my story. Um, I have um, been, gone out into the community um, and gave out um, resources. I've spoken at, you know, churches anywhere that they would allow me to speak and um, provide me a safe space to do so. I did that. Um, I um, created my own foundation. I'm so excited. It's called yeah. What I Learned with the Tiger Lily Foundation and educating and empowering women um, to make sure that they're getting um, their breasts checked and making sure that they are educated about their family history. Um, that is really, really near and dear to my heart because um, the family history part um, I didn't have. Um, it was very difficult for me to go and grab that information when I need it, so I want to make sure that everyone starts that now. Um, but just, you know, I've had unbelievable opportunities um, because of the Tiger Lily Foundation and many doors have opened for me, so I'm very thankful. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you. Um, Keisha didn't share a bit, of, a lot about her work doing a lot of media with for breast cancer and black women. She's now engaging in a clinical trial campaign with Tiger Lily, but sharing in her community as well. She's given thousands of hours of her time while going through treatment to serve women in her community doing outreach, health fairs, events, and speaking. So for me, the power in investing in patients is that, you know, they're in the community. They live there, they work there, they play there, they pray there. They know what the community wants and they're not just being told to do a job. They love what they're doing and they're trusted and they're the ones making that change. So if you're saying thank you to me, I'm saying thank you to you because you've been doing amazing things, Keisha. Yeah, the I, I you, the social media, I, I, and I always add that in. I, I guess I didn't add it. You did add that in. Oh, I got you, boo. <laughs> That's what everybody knows me for, social media. But yes, um, social media. So one of the things, uh, I'll touch on that just a bit. Um, one of the things I did when I was diagnosed the first time, I was already um, actively on social media because I was calling myself going through a fitness change because I was turning 50. <laughs> So, but um, I started to share my story on social media. I shared um, all the good, the bad, everything um, that was, I was going through while I was um, going through treatment. And um, it, some days it was not pretty, and I shared that too. And I did that because I wanted people to see what it looked like because a lot of times we don't see what that looks like. Like we know of someone that had, you know, breast cancer that are going through it, but we don't see what they're going through. The struggle. And, yes, the struggle, every, you know, the everyday, the, you know, can't get up because your bones are hurting so bad and having to take those shots, you know. I showed pictures of my husband giving me the shots, you know, that I needed to have so that I can get up and walk, you know. Um, and I just felt that it was super important to do that um, so that, we wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. That we would, you know, I don't wanna say embrace it, but we would be able to share it so the next person knows what to expect. Um, and then, you know, and from that, I got a lot of questions. You know, um, I had a lot of, um, I met so many people that just, um, on social media that um, were so appreciative of me putting that information out there because they thought that they were alone and they're not alone, and, I, and I, no one should have to go through that fight by themselves. Luckily for me, I had a really great support system, but what about that young lady that did not, you know, that is there by herself with two or three kids that are, you know, following, and she still has to get up and go to work every day. So People I wanted see to that. make sure. They don't see that part of it, and I think exactly. that we have turned breast cancer into this warrior pink hero thing. It's not, it's not what it is. No. I mean, I never wanted to be a warrior, and I didn't feel like one when I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. I couldn't pull my pants down and go to the bathroom. I couldn't walk to the bathroom. I would be having nausea and throwing up and be sick, and because the treatments weren't targeting black women's bodies, what I had, I had horrible side effects. I would have rashes, and I would be itching. And I look on social media and see all these women who were, didn't look like me, and they were all happy and smiling, and they're warriors, and I'm like, I don't, I can barely go to the bathroom. I can get out of bed. I've lost 20 pounds in less than six weeks. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm struggling here. This is not what breast cancer looks like. And so part of the intro program is empowering women to be able to know how to act, but also to be empowering you to be yourself, your authentic self, because 
putting a mask on actually is another disease, right? It's another way of hiding who we are from the public and people can't see what you're struggling through, but they can go through that and know they're not alone as well. And so thanks for sharing, Keisha. And Kawana has been sharing a lot too. Um, Kawana, I want you to talk a bit about the, the BMSF work that we did the pilot. And um, as a patient, how you've seen the outcomes of your life and your work shift um, when, when you've been given the leeway to create? Because usually in the past, when people give us funding to do things, they'd be like, here's the money, you're gonna do that, 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 and that, and then give us a metric. And one of the, the things that our funders did this past year, which why, why I love them the past two or three years, actually, they were like, well, what do you wanna create? I'm like, I can do that, whatever I want. You tell me a unicorn to do whatever she wants? Okay, I can do that. And then they give you all the leeway to say, just create some things, you know? Um, social media content, you know, sharing your ideas with the community. Um, can you say what it felt like? Because people always say like, what is the core of the intro program? For me, it's empowerment. Mm -hmm. When you light somebody's candle and they wake up to what they can actually be, their orange just squeeze and it comes out, that juice and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like you all become so empowered and that's what people can't really quantify, but you can't put a dollar on a person's spirit a dollar amount. So can you share how that's empowered you and how you see that paradigm, you know, could transform how we engage with pharma, scientific communities, researchers, and policymakers, because you've been part of all that with the ANGEL program, right? Absolutely. Um, so for me, um, I'll just give a little background. When I was di diagnosed, I was 37 years old, and I knew nothing about breast cancer. What are you, not 35? 32? 28? <laughs> <laughs> She's in backwards, okay? <laughs> I'm 43 years old now. Uh, and like Keisha, I'm a two time survivor. So when uh, Tiger Lily found me, I was on my second, round, second uh, diagnosis. And I didn't have a community because I came from a very, yeah, I grew up very spiritual. Um, and for some reason, for me, I just knew that I was going to overcome, right? Um, and something about me was like, when I went into the groups and I saw people on social media, people were showing their struggle. For me, I wanted to show people how to triumph. So I immediately submerged myself into education and I became a board certified health coach. I, I have a degree in- During your treatment process? Yes, during Girl. my treatment <laughs> process. <laughs> like the first year, like it was within six months, I was like, okay, so if I have to go through X, Y, and Z, I need to know how I'm gonna support myself because I still wanna look good and feel good. I don't just want to survive, I wanna thrive. So as I was um, going through my treatment, I was reading books <laughs> to be certified. I already had two degrees in something else. Um, and so people started reaching out to me because I did acknowledge that I had breast cancer, but I didn't share any of what I was actually doing. It was more about them seeing me working out, what I was eating and those things. So. I started building a community around me and people started reaching out to me. I tried some support groups. People just didn't have the same mentality that I had and it made me depressed. So I didn't have anyone. The only person I had was my big brother who was not a breast cancer survivor, but he had, uh, he had survived uh, two aneurysms on the brain two years before my diagnosis and he was not supposed to live, but he re rehabilitated himself within two months and was the picture perfect person walking around. Nobody ever knew what he had really gone through. So um, as I started working with Tiger Lily, it was just like picking up what I was doing and putting it into a, this community. Um, I started working for a naturopathic physician um, who really specializes in cancer patients. And she gave me a caseload. I had about 15 to 30 patients while I was going through my treatment. Um, but what I will say about serving is it's selfish and selfless, right? Because you feel good when you see people doing well. So once I started serving people, I started getting this great feeling and I was like, this is exactly where I'm meant to be. And I really felt like my purpose, um, you know, flourished. And so being a part of Tiger Lily this past year, um, I think my first uh, event was the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium where I actually got to sit in the room with physicians and advocates and document what I heard. And my oncologist actually was on one of those boards. And I was like, I remember sitting in his room and him looking at me saying, you're going you're gonna to survive this and you're going to come back and help others. And so it was full circle to actually do that event. Um, being on Capitol Hill the other week was simply amazing to really know that we can walk in and speak to um, 
you know, representatives and them actually co-sponsor our bill because they hear our voices. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a hard sale. It was like just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and giving lived experience alongside of, and we've seen great things. Um, the other thing that I've been able to do is I started a breast health education program. I started that before Tiger Lily where I was going into the high schools teaching how to do breast exams. And I wanted to do that because my mom sat down with me at 16 and taught me how to check my breasts because she had breast problems. Um, and so when I started that, I didn't have any funding. I just started in the high school doing it. And then when I came as a part of Tiger Lily, um, I was able to incorporate that right into the program. And uh, the young ladies, I've taught over 300 young ladies in the Pittsburgh area in high school how to do breast health, edu um, breast health checks. And we also talk about overall wellness. Most of the questions the young lady says, how do I prevent? And so we talk a lot about health and fitness and all the things. So it's really been like an amazing experience. And then when you look back and those young ladies come back and say, I went home and helped my mom check her breast, or I talked to my aunt about breast cancer, or I talked to my grandmother, I found out there's a history there. It's been amazing. And then also working in the communities, um, just talking to uh, individuals who have no resources, like they were the first, like you, in the black community, I think a lot of times we just don't talk about our health enough. And so when you actually get to engage with women who say, I, I didn't have anybody to talk to, but I'm dealing with this thing too. I'm, I'm, having, I'm in breast cancer now. I have treatments, you know, my nipples inverted. I have these things, they're asking these questions and you're able to provide them with resources and then also give them a place to go. It's so, it's, it feels great. Yeah, you talked about in the prep call about being able to have uh, access to support through the organization to get like, to help people get support doing hi different, using hybrid methods. So it wasn't like this one program to do one thing. There's social media, there's policy, there's engaging with scientific, scientists and researchers, getting involved in clinical trials and community outreach. So like you're able to help people different ways and meet them where they work. So like for Keisha, sharing her journey was a unique perspective, right? She was sharing the truth of how she felt for her be able to share your truth in different ways as well and impact people, because what you learn at San Antonio Breast, what you learn on the Hill, you can take it back to the community and do work there. So I think for me, the beauty is that you can take something that's really powerful, become more empowered, mic drop, literally, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> boom. <laughs> drop the mic. You can, I like that, I'm so, I'm so funny. Oh, anyway, I, I just like myself sometimes. <laughs> I couldn't help it. And I still have had no martinis this morning, no wine, just this is me without alcohol. <laughs> but I love taking that, you could take all these things and take it back in the community in different ways. And each person's different. I think diversity for me is not only just about color. It's more than color. It's about where you are in the moment. It's about where you live. It's where, how you're feeling. It's what you think your journey is. And for me, it's like allowing, giving advocates the power to speak your truth and be able to empower you and then support you and pay for that too. because. You know, when I began my work, nobody paid people to tell, tell their stories. No one paid you to be able to be in a campaign. They were like, can you tell your story and just maybe that you start crying and then, okay, we got that. But you're able to take, you know, get support. Because part of my motto at Tiger Lily is these patients are leaders. They're, they're, they're experts in what they do. It should be paid for their time. And so as you're doing the work and you're speaking, it's, it's like compensating you as a, legal, a doctor or anybody else, right? So you have the freedom to take care of your bills and overcome other disparities you're facing financially maybe and support you in doing the work. Um, so I love that as well. Still the awesome talking points, by the way. <laughs> um, but that's me. Um, so Lindsay, um, we Lindsay and I met a while back and we've been talking a lot about partnership. You know, we often hear about a lot of groups like that compete, but I think that you can't do this work without having partners because we can't all do the same thing all the time and there's so much to get done. Um, can you share a bit about, Lindsay, what you're doing with Survive Her? And, you know, we talked a bit about your model being different because, you know, we, we, our healthcare system is more of a sick care system. It's really about chronic health, not about for risk reduction and prevention. People don't invest in that as much, which is why I love what you guys do with Angel Advocates and even with your own nonprofit. Can you share a bit about what you do differently? Because, you know, you're doing a lot around holistic you're doing a lot around community outreach because of, you know, with your own nonprofit now, really, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And Survivor is kind of new on the, on the scene. How is it different from the other organizations and how can it fill a unique niche for black women in the community? So through Survivor, we work to improve health outcomes by curating community embedded 
lifestyle, experiences, and events. And so because I'm events driven and I love bringing people together to have a great time, I have found, and our model has worked successfully, that we, we meet women where they are by hosting events um, through content collaboration and conversation. So there is power in partnership. Um, and I will just share a few examples of events Please. that have worked that have been very successful for us. One of which is our Breast Cancer Awareness Block Party that we co-host in collaboration with Afropink, another CBO. We go into the heart of Harlem and we have 20 plus organizations, health-based organizations in a fair style setup. Um, we integrated Tiger Lily to facilitate panel discussions. And as women were traversing the space and walking by, I mean, we're at the Federal State Building on Adam Clayton Powell in Harlem. As women are um, traversing the space, they can get a free mammogram at the mammogram truck, and they can learn about early detection, prevention, breast health. So we're really meeting women and men too where they are. We also hosted our inaugural Breast Cancer Awareness Brunch during the Essence Festival in New Orleans, which is one of the number one um, convenings of black women. Again, meeting them at social events where we know that they'll listen, maybe while they're sipping a mimosa, but they're gonna listen about breast right. health. So we always integrate an educational component. My kind of girl. We also host educational workshops with the largest hospital system in Houston, which is where I reside. Um, it's called Treat Her, which is our, one of our signature events. So we're treating survivors and supporters to an experience not only of education, but we um, brought in a masseuse to offer massages and they get food. I mean, it's, it's really events driven, but there's power and partnership and collaboration. That has been our success rate and our model that has, I think, made us very unique. We also, MAMA, have a very robust media portfolio. Leveraging my, my former news reporter background, I've been able to broadcast the importance of early detection, genetic testing, and prevention just through using this microphone in a very impactful way to communicate with audiences nationwide. So that's what makes Survivor unique. Wonderful, I love it. Thanks, Lindsay, thank you so much. <laughs> Can we give her a hand? So I'm seeing that what, what's really interesting here is that you all are bringing embedded community mod with models into the into, to play. So people talk about investing in community, but you can't invest because you want something back. You have to invest just to make people feel like you, want, you hear them, you see them, you understand them, and then you do the work. And so I think as you look at clinical trial engagement and building trust in, in, in pharma and in healthcare, um, it's really about living a lifestyle of health, right? Because we invest a lot of money in other things, but not in our health until we get sick. But if you were to reverse that model and start doing the work, like you share your workouts on Instagram, I've seen them, it's awesome. <laughs> You share your holistic work, you're out there having brunches so that healthcare becomes how you live. Your friends are about their healthcare journey. Your spouse gets to be like you're invested in their healthcare, so whether it's diabetes or cancer or whatever, it's all about risk reduction and then adhering to care. So you're making, um, for black women who may not trust healthcare historically, you're making healthcare part of our, your lifestyle. And people see that and they hear that. People are always DMing me all the time, like, what's that that you're drinking? It looks so disgusting. <laughs> I'm like, it's called wheatgrass juice, spirulina, it's nasty as hell, but you know what? Like, it's, this is 50 years old right now, okay? Right. And I'm still here, <laughs> so it's like, you know, how do you, how do you make this a lifestyle? And to be honest, you know, th this morning I was crying when I got up just to be able to be like amongst all of you and to be 17 years alive post CNBC without recurrence, you know? Um, thank you all. I wanna have other black women have the opportunity to be able to have access to life-saving treatment but to also um, imp and, and import um, complementary health as a way of supporting that because we have to, someone mentioned this earlier, the bell rings, but you still have to deal with cancer for the rest of your life. And so that never stops. The mental, the fear, the psychosocial pieces, the, you know, what you're eating, how you're resting, all the things you're putting in on your body. Um, there was a study done recently that talked about um, how much you put toxins in black women's healthcare products. So, I want to tell women to be careful about that too. So it's a whole lifestyle that we're addressing, not just the chronic care piece, but even addressing that as well and then getting women supported beyond just that because we have to always be vigilant about potential recurrence and, and also side effects, you know? How many of us have like heart issues here? You know, lung issues, <laughs> bone issues. Hot flashes. It, yeah, hot flashes. It never stops. Yeah, it never stops. She, she has a fan she carries around because it never stops. 
you have one too. I'll hide mine in my bag sometimes. May, yeah. may I share that when most people think you ring the bell and you finished your surgery, that that is it. But our journey, this is our journey. This is survivorship journey. is our journey, and this is part of our life, everyday life, and maintaining this life and adjusting to this new lifestyle, adjusting to this new body. There is a lot that really most people to. don't realize or understand, but this is survivorship. Absolutely. It's ongoing for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's why sisterhood is so important that, you know, you're not alone in that process, you know? Um, and we'll discuss clinical trials later, but that's a whole other really important issue and why this model does work. And so you invested in, the BMS invested in Pamela, right? Yes, okay. Email brain sometimes. Pamela's with BMSF, and BMSF gave us a huge two-year grant to up to, to force multiply the ANGEL program, to look at ways to build a program that's sustainable over the, the long haul. And through that program, we could build um, the modules out, build the recruitment out, build the staff out, and really be able to sustain work in the communities. And we picked 21 communities, and my staff said, what, 21, are you crazy? I said, yes, I am. Um, so we picked 21, and then we put five on steroids, glucose steroids, wheatgrass juice. Um, we put five, like, <laughs> five that, that were really immersive, where we had five angel advocates who were in treatment working to create community-based programmatic work, and it was really powerful. And thank you all for that investment. Um, it was a lot of money, too. And I was like, oh my God, but it helped us to get the work done. And I think that model of you have women who are black and brown, who want to do the work, who want to share their stories, who want to build trust, but oftentimes we can't because we don't have the investment it takes to do that. Um, when I was at the BMSF Grantee Summit this year, they had other grantees that were talking about these impact grants they've given, um, which is wonderful for other disease states as well. Can you share about the model of what you guys did and why you do it? Because it was really, really generous and really impactful. And without that grant, we wouldn't have had the, the case study for why this works with black-led, black-supported, black-co-created, black-funded, because we paid people for their time as expert. And the work they did was epic. It was so amazing. So what, what do you guys, why do you do it? How do you do it? How did the model come about? And what have you seen success-wise from not only us, but other nonprofits as well that could be shared with our partners and friends in the room. Sure, well, one of the things that we, we do often at BMS is our, man, our mantra. And so we think, why do we do what we do? Why are we here? Why, how do we get here? Um, and for me, I'm a mom, I have three kids. They're, you know, downtown someplace. So um, for me, it's really, you know, thinking about my family and my community. And so I, um, my father died from cancer. My half-sister died from cancer as well. Um, and unfortunately, in America, your zip code has a greater impact on your health than your DNA. And that's unacceptable. So when we think about what we do, we also think about what have we not done yet? Um, who haven't we reached? And what can we do to build trust and reach those communities? And that's something that we think about quite often at Bristol Myers Webb and also the Bristol Myers Webb Foundation, which funded the Tiger Lily um, Advocates as well. And for us, kind of reaching the community that we have not reached yet is really looking at these non-traditional partners, um, whether it's hip hop public health. I'm not sure how many people have learned about hip hop public health. Can you share more about that as well? Sure, so that's an initiative um, that really was brought out of our employee resource group. Um, there were several PSAs that Dougie Fresh and others had done um, during the COVID pandemic, just basic uh, COVID prevention, like what is COVID, how can we get treatment, and it's morphed since then, but it was employee-led, and uh, BMS and the foundation got involved in that and supported through grants, uh, this hip-hop public health, really to target specific communities that are being um, under-resourced, understaffed as well. And you know, there's others that we're looking at targeting that are, you know, not resource, not getting the same amount of attention. You know, you all talk about partnerships and the patient voice, and how can we elevate those voices? So whether it's the Black Church Initiative that we have within DC, or funding the um, 2030 Black Church Conference to kind of bridge that gap between the faith and public health community as well. So it's, it's being strategic in reaching communities and make sure their voices are elevated. And I love what you said about speaking with legislators, making sure your voice is heard. And we all should feel empowered at the state, at the federal level to share your stories. Because what we're seeing in terms of 
your personal stories with adherence, um, access and affordability, that matters because that differs by zip code, right? And so we need to not just raise awareness, okay, but also solutions. And that was mentioned during our, our opening remarks. And so driving that policy, and that's what, you know, our focus at Bristol Myers Squibb is health and also patients, and how can we merge those two together? And that's kind of where our health equity commitments um, are really drove from. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mandy, you. <laughs> so you do a lot of work in the community, and you do a lot of work that's similar to uh, what we do is engaging um, patients as community health workers. Um, and you work at a large healthcare system, right? Um, share a bit about what that model is and why it works. Sorry about that. Um, I knew that was going to happen. It's like that moment. Um, so I will say that most of my work has really been in the system. I, the vast majority of my work is talking to providers, doing education around implicit bias, working on systems, setting up diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, task forces, and trying to look at the structural kind of issues within our systems. Uh, originally, when I came in to research, I thought, oh, we've got to get all the patients into the system. And then I thought, well, we kind of got to get our house in order. So I've, most of my work focuses on trying to help systems. However, six months ago, I got a wonderful grant from Gilead and was able to launch with some fabulous people on my team, Shayla Scarlett and Jacqueline Beal, um, something called our Neighborhood Health Ambassador Network. And what we decided to do was recruit people from each of the neighborhoods in the DC catchment area from the African American, African immigrant, Latina, and queer populations. Uh, vast majority are black, but we have uh, a few Latina and queer uh, representatives. And we uh, partnered with a community-based organization to provide 100 hours of community health worker training. Um, 27 individuals got through that training and are going to be graduating in a couple weeks. They're now going through 44 hours of practica. Um, they were paid $1,500 to get through the training and $25 an hour for their outreach work. Um, and we asked our community advisory board what, we, what appropriate compensation should look like, somewhere between 23 and 25 an hour, um, which was actually did come from some faith-based leadership recommendations. Um, so we now have one of them actually, we didn't realize one of them was in Nigeria, so that person can't actually help us with outreach in DC. But I'm like, look at the global impact, that's amazing. Um, but we have 26 people who are out in the community and actually just a few weeks ago, a couple of them got together and they said, hey, well, why don't we go where we always go to, you know, there's this safe way that a lot of us go to. Three of them got together, reached 100 people, totally community driven, CHW driven, neighborhood health ambassador driven. Um, and so we're really in the early days of that. Um, we're still working with a communications firm to do some focus group testing and make sure our messages are um, resonating with the community. But in the meantime, um, my whole career is about using what we have now. So we have non-GW branded things that work um, that we're bringing into the community and having conversations. Primary emphasis is on getting back to screening after COVID, but also holistic health, health promotion, tobacco cessation, reduction, um, social support. I mean, one of the things that I'm just floored, I, I'm so honored to be here, and I'm like, are you sure you want me on this panel? But um, just the level of kind of commitment to connection and social support that I'm hearing, which is so critical. And I think the other side of that is the structural pieces that we need to address. So those are the those are the things that I'm working on. Um, the other thing I will say is that, um, two things. One, um, my lovely boss, Dr. Julie Bowman, had a conversation with me a couple weeks ago and I had advocated for three community health worker positions within the cancer center. And she said, well, why don't we just sustain the neighborhood health ambassador network instead of hiring the third one? I was like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. So rather than having to look for additional funding, we're not hiring a third CHW, we're, we were sustaining that program, which is so nice because we can't always do that. So that felt awesome. Um, and then I will just say the other project uh, that I'm working on that is very um, resonant with all of this is a CDC funded research project where we, I work with Dr. Hannah Aram at MedStar and Talisha Taylor um, at Howard and we have been systematizing social needs screening at the three cancer centers um, to try to ask about food, housing, um, transportation, and we've had some really, and we've hired people, I had the honor of hiring someone that I worked with 
in Black Women Thriving in um, East of the River, who we trained as a community health worker and is on fire kind of helping people in clinic. And um, we've had about 122 people enroll in the last year and a half, 94% um, satisfaction rate, but just a lot of like basic things, food needs and setting people up with weekly food delivery, food um, programs, and making sure that if someone is going through treatment or has side effects of treatment, they have safe housing. Um, so, you know, I always, I worked in cancer for 20 years, but it's not really about the tumor. It's kind of about the patients and the systems and what kinds of things we need to do to make sure people can access these things that we discover. So, um, thank you so much for letting me be here. Happy to answer any other questions, but that's kind of the complementary side of what I do um, with these champions. It's wonderful. Um, as we close out, I want to ask Lindsay, Kawana, and Keisha, can you give her a hand, please? She's so badass, <laughs> you know? Um, it's been a dream for, for as, as a patient to see that we have advocates in the hospital system because people tend to get through go to treatment, they get these brochures, you take the brochure home, you're overwhelmed, you go to Dr. Google, you spend hours getting yourself spun up, <laughs> then you, you Dr. Google, you get all stressed out, you find the Facebook group, oh my God, I'm dying tomorrow, you know? You get terrified. <laughs> And you finally find a patient group after months and months of being stressed out or getting through treatment alone. So what if you have a patient advocate that's embedded in the hospital system to say, okay, yeah, here you go. Here's a hand for you to hold on to, a life raft. Like, that's what I, I wanted, and that's what we want to give to our angel advocates. So you have that, and that is freaking brilliant, and we just, that's so awesome to hear. I want to see it all over the country. You guys make it happen. Yeah, so in closing, um, you know, part of what we do at Tiger Lily and what we love about our patients is that you are dreamers. You all see a need, you dream about it, and you do it. You know, you're still working while building Survivor, which I did for 14 years. I worked full time and a part-time job and built it. And, you know, I want to see women like you, Lindsay, and all of you excel faster because it shouldn't take us 14 years to rise to the top, right? It should take, it should be, there's money out there for us to all be successful and um, lift each other up. So. If you were to tell our partners and friends in the room, you guys, if you dream and collectively dream and you say it out loud, I think, I believe that things manifest. You say it, you think it, you move into it, and it shows up, right? Because you, you attract what you put out there. Um, what would you want to see manifested? Start with Lindsay. In the, in the dream world of Lindsay, and as a black woman, a patient advocate, um, what would you dream about that you want to see manifest in the world in the future that could be, be like the nirvana of patient-centric health care, community outreach, all of that. So, and you just said it, if you, and I'm, I'm a believer, so I know Habakkuk 2.2, it says you write it, you believe it, it will come to pass. And so what I've been manifesting, Mema, is to open a Survive Her Center that would um, accommodate women, specifically those who are um, maybe single mothers who need transitional housing or some type of support resource, because I found that even through our financial support component, the women who come to us are those in need of those types of services. So that's one. And just overall is to become the global advocate of breast cancer awareness. But I will say, and you mentioned this earlier, we can't execute our mission, which is to inform, inspire, and to empower women about breast cancer awareness and wellness without critical funding. Um, we're in the trenches, we're in the communities, but we can't do that without funding. Funding is so needed for community-based organizations. Thank you. Kawana, what is your dream? My dream is to have a global breast health wellness education program in all high schools across America. Um, my passion are the babies because I was diagnosed so young. Um, I really see how young minds think and how creative they are and how um, inspired they are and how inquisitive they are. And I feel like the future of uh, healing cancer comes through their hands. So when I sit in these classrooms with these young women and they're like telling me like, they wanna know more, tell me more about the products I should use, what food should I eat, how do I exercise, can I go home and do this to my, and even young men. <laughs> it's funny, we had five young men sign up to do the breast health education class. <laughs> And they asked me, Kwana, can the they come? Though? What was the reason, though? Yeah, they said, can they come? I said, absolutely. And they were like, I don't know if they're coming for the right reason. I said, absolutely. Because one day they were going to, they're going to like those breasts. <laughs> right? 
So yes, yes they can. They might help their mother or wife help discover their lump, right? Um, so that is where I would love- Is that love the late night class? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were so funny, but they actually came and they supported. So that's what I would like to see. I think the future is in their hands and I really want to, uh, I remember wellness being something a part of my high school journey, but a lot of schools have taken that out. Um, and so many young folks are the mouthpieces of their families. And I think we will really affect change when we start working within our own families first to have conversations about our, about our health. And it's healing as well. I think that the legacy that we've had of things that have happened that were bad, the, a lot of bad things have happened. But there's a saying, I love quotes, it's like, don't look behind, you're not going that way. Absolutely. You have an accident, we look behind. So, and there's been a lot done to protect us from the things that happened in the past that aren't gonna happen any longer. So for me, like you all, it's been to get people to think about how do we innovate for the future? I don't wanna repeat the statistics about black women dying or about the clinical trial, things about Henry, Henry Locks, they've happened. And we are making a lot of, uh, doing a lot of work to heal the, because it takes time to heal. People have to talk about these things to heal, but not to keep perpetuating that mistrust because that won't help to heal black people in this, in, at all. So um, I love getting young people involved to your point because that's how you start, you start fresh with what, how they think now, the legacy of the future and of transformation and of targeted treatments. And at some point we'll have a world where people will not die of cancer It'll be a chronic disease, not a terminal one. That's our goal. That is the goal. We'll close with you, Keisha. For me, um, my ultimate goal is before everyone, as you see me sitting here, this is not, has not always been me. I have been homeless. I have been a single mom on welfare. Um, I have come from drug addicted parents. Um, when I went through my um, cancer diagnosis and treatment, I was not in that place anymore, but I can't help but think about those that are still in that place, and that could have been me. And so my ultimate goal with my organization is to create um, financial stability or hope for those that do not have it. Um, for that young lady or woman or that is working at Target, that needs her pg and &E bill paid. I wanna cut the red tape and be able to provide those funds for them so that they can just worry about uh, their healing and not about financial. So that's my ultimate goal. That's beautiful, Keisha. So you've heard from the, these amazing women's mouths and you both are amazing supporters. Mandy, thank you for all your work. And I'm so inspired by all of you. Thanks for your support at BMSF. But this is the future of, of, of healthcare and equity. And so let's, you know, let's support them in their dreams, support them in their daily lives and in their healing. Because Keisha, you mentioned you've been through a lot. You see people like us who are like survivors and warriors, but we, not, we weren't always in this place. We're still healing from our past. And I too have gone through some of the things you've been through. People see us as being fearless, but you know, I have lost my home when I began. I, was, I didn't have a spouse, I just had to deal with it myself. And bags of bills, bags of treatment, and having the lights cut off. People are like, do you have your lights cut off? I did. Um, but you have to think, choose between your health care and dying or taking care of the light bill, the water bill. And so my child has gone through things where the water may have been turned off. I'm like, well, you know what, we'll just don't, we'll take the French bath for the next 24 hours, 48 hours. But, you have to think about to make the choice that you have to make to survive and get through cancer. And that's why it's so important that you understand that even while there's hope for us and we're changing this landscape, um, the journey hasn't always been easy. For many women who are where Keisha was before she was Keisha now, before I was where I was, where I am today, we didn't have certain things. And when you don't have, when you have to choose between a light bill and water bill and food and, and or dying, what do you choose? Some make the other choice and they don't make it. And so part of this works to change that legacy of equity, of giving people that support they need. And, and that's why we're here on a national level, but we wanna help people who are on the community level, which is why we invest so much in our partners. We invested in Lindsay's event. So we pay it back through supporting and funding, giving them money and Keisha's event, because I wanna have them have that leg up. And so as you leave this room or this conversation, think about how you can each make a difference in your communities um, by supporting other patients and other groups and us, but also like, what can you do? What is your privilege? Because you're breathing and living, your heart's beating to give back to the community and make it one of equitable health for all. 
Thank you all so much, and y'all were fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. So you know what? It's time for our second panel. We've got a lot more coming for you right now, so that was great. Thank you all for sharing your commitments and action items. I'm feeling really motivated by all of your ideas. So let's continue this momentum and move into our second panel of the day. What Nirvana looks like for BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We just heard that back there. But what does that look like in the context of patients and clinical trials? Joining us to discuss this important topic again is our wonderful moderator, as she chews her croissant back there, over there. <laughs> Mema, we would like to welcome you back up to the stage. And as she's making her way to the stage, I'm going to go ahead and begin to introduce our impressive set of panelists. Finish your meal, bring it on up. The first is uh, Dr. Sarah Horton. So as I call your name, please make your way to the stage. Um, Dr. Horton is a board certified medical oncologist and the executive director of access and diversity at Quantum Leap, Leap excuse me, Healthcare a nonprofit dedicated to advancing breast cancer clinical trials. Holding an affiliate associate professorship at Howard University Cancer Center, she brings, <laughs> hello there, welcome. She brings, I'm um, sorry, I lost my place here. So you got me all discombobulated, giving time for uh, Mama to finish her meal there. That's what, it, that's what I'm really doing here. Oh, you did, okay, okay, cool, right, let, me, let me go ahead. Okay, um, she brings her experience to transdisciplinary breast cancer clinics. With a remarkable career spanning over two decades, Dr. Horton is a trailblazer in addressing cancer outcome disparities and advocating for diversity in clinical trials. Her leadership roles at Howard University Hospital and the FDA have left an indelible mark on the field, evident in her numerous papers on disparities in cancer outcomes among African American patients. Dr. Horton completed her hematology oncology fellowship at Georgetown University Lombardi Cancer Center and currently calls Silver Spring, Maryland her home, where she resides with her family and two rescue dogs, Pixie and Mia. Please join me in welcoming the accomplished and dedicated Dr. Horton. She's on the stage. Next for you, we have Chris Dolphin. Chris? Wherever you are, come on up to the stage. Okay, sneaking up behind me. Beyond being a devoted husband and father, Mr. Dolphine is a remarkable advocate, experienced caregiver, and a successful business owner. His journey has been intertwined with the late Dr. Lori Wilson, a renowned figure as the Associate Dean of Faculty Development and Diversity Professor of Surgery and Chief of Surgical Oncology at Howard University. Dr. Dolphine's unwavering support for Dr. Wilson extended through her multifaceted career as a professor, a physician, a clinician, and an advocate. He stood by her side, not only in professional triumphs, but also during the challenging times as she navigated her own journey as a cancer patient and thriver, driven by a deep passion to honor Dr. Wilson's legacy. Mr. Dolphine has dedicated himself to advocating for education, health equity, and the enhancement of diversity in clinical trials with a specific focus on women of color. Today, he shares his insights and commitment with us, carrying forward the impactful work initiated by the late Dr. Lori Wilson. Please join me in welcoming Chris to the stage. <laughs> Next on our panel, we have Kendall Whitlock. Kendall, come on up. Yes. I feel like Price is right almost, so come on down, right? So <laughs> Kendall Whitlock, head of digital optimization at Walgreens, is dedicated to advancing culturally responsive clinical care research through data and community collaborations, making clinical trials more accessible and convenient. With nearly 25 years, let me look at your face. 25 years? Oh, L'Oreal, okay. <laughs> uh, maybe it was that wheat juice that uh, Mama talked about earlier, right? <laughs> 
25 years of pharmaceutical industry experience. She is a thought leader advocating for digital literacy, health equity, and patient empowerment through data-driven customization. Holding a master's of public health degree and pursuing her doctorate, she's a trailblazer in various leadership roles. She has received recognition for her contributions, including being named one of Diversity Women Media Elite 100, class of 2023, and receiving the inaugural Carrie Murphy Healy Center Health Innovation Award. Welcome to the stage. Neha Shah Londonia. That was the one that gave me nightmares all night while I was practicing this. Did I get that right? How do you say that? Londonia? Ladonia, thank you, as you come to the stage here, is currently Segan's Director of Global Clinical Trial Diversity, where she leads global initiatives to improve and increase equity and inclusion in oncology clinical trials. In her 23 plus years of drug development experience, Neha has developed a strong strategic and operational skill set through expansion of levels of responsibility at pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and CRO organizations. She has hands-on knowledge at the site level, progressing through her career into global trial operations in phase one through phase four trials. In a broad range of therapeutic areas, Neha has a passion for driving sustainable, innovative solutions to improve outcomes for the diversification of clinical trial participants across the ecosystem. Welcome to the stage. I have one more for you. Christina Mackey is making her way to the stage. Christina, there she is over there. Christina is a stage 3B breast cancer survivor, serves as a development consultant in Houston, with a master's in English and education from Pepperdine University and the University of South Florida. Her personal journey has fueled a passionate commitment to helping others facing similar hardships. In her role, Christina leverages her deep understanding of the nonprofit sector, creative vision, and ability to connect with people to drive fundraising and outreach efforts that bring meaningful change. Beyond her professional accomplishments, she continues to inspire others with her uplifting presence and willingness to openly share her story, offering solace, courage, and a sense of belonging to those in need. Welcome. Thank you all. Can you hear me? I can't tell. OK, wonderful. Thanks for being here, um, all of you. I'm just so pleased to have you. Um, you're all very special to me. As, as many of the, our, my friends know, I, I just I love people. So I collect good people to work with because the, the world, that makes the world go around, makes the work better, and it's just, it's all about heart, heart-centeredness. Um, this panel's really special to me. Um, as, as you may have heard, um, Chris is Dr. Lori Wilson's husband, and Sarah is her dear friend. Uh, Lori um, was someone who, who is very important to me. Um, she, I met her, and um, just through the work in the breast cancer space, and you know when you meet somebody you like look up to and you're like, oh my God, she's my hero. Can I just like give her a hug or touch her or hold her hand? And I could see Dr. Wilson, she's like, just call me Lori. And then she was like, I'm as in awe of you doing what you're doing. And I'm like, do you know who I am, you know? And she was just an amazing woman. She was a physician, a professor. She was an amazing, brilliant surgeon. Um, and I seen her in The Emperor of All Maladies and just watched her on television and so in awe of her. And she became, she was my mentor, became my mentor. And then a dear friend. And, um, you know, she's somebody who, she, she supersedes um, physical body. Um, in Lori's life, she was dynamic and amazing. And um, one of the last times we talked, she was well, active and just doing the work. And she said, don't tell anybody I don't feel good. It's about the work, not about me. And that was how she lived her work. She never said she was tired. She was always about her patient. And she was so involved in the work. One time she and Chris were on vacation and she snuck away and called me about a clinical trial thing we were talking about. She said, don't tell Chris I called you. Um, that's how dedicated she was. And she was hiding behind the beach someplace to talk about her work. But Lori not only was a physician, 
been a breast cancer surgeon, um, but then she got breast cancer. And she, at some point, was um, NED, and she's very and well. And then it came back. And for many of us who knew her, we were just like, oh my God. And then she got into a clinical trial, and she, she kicked it, she, she killed it. She was doing really well, and then it came back with a vengeance. And just to even speak about her not being here is still very unreal to me. It's been about a year. And I've been blessed to know Chris as a caregiver and a friend now. And um, so I dedicate this panel to Lori, who truly inspires me to do the work that I do. And with the grace that she brought to the work, and all of you on this panel are a living testament of the work that she began doing. With your work at Walgreens, the work you do at CGEN, you being in clinical trial, just being in trial at some point, um, Christina, and being her friend and her husband and caregiver. So I just want to start off with that energy of this conversation that it's really about people that we're talking about, not just the study number, but real people that live in, in transition and, and um, their legacy carries the work forward. So Christina, you've been such an amazing inspiration to me. Um, you also are a Tiger Lily Foundation angel, and um, you recently joined our Living Legacy um, clinical trial campaign that we've been doing to help people understand why trials are important, but to share their challenges and their fears, and, and that, but why they really work. If we don't let go of the past and move forward, we don't get to innovate, create better science for black bodies. Um, and we had a powerful conversation in Houston, right, where you talked to a woman who, um, you've been on the trial that she was able to get a benefit from as well, and you helped to bring people to trials by building that trust. Share a bit about your journey within the clinical trial space and what it meant to you before going into it, going into it and what you know now, and why it's so important to get black women to understand the importance of science. Thank you, Marlon. Can you all hear me? Can I get a thumbs up in the back? Yes. Thumbs up. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I just, I really like to give honor to the space before I enter it with my words, and thank you so much, Marla, for having me. Um, I'm just, I'm really humbled and really honored to be here. So my body is sitting, but my spirit is on its face. I'm really, really honored to be in this space. Um, and I, I had a full circle moment just now, um, hearing Lori's name and, and her legacy, and being able to put a name to the road that I was on, knowing that it was blazed before me and, and I stand on her shoulders and I'm alive because of her, her work and sacrifice, so I'm just honored for that. Um, Candace is the young lady that I met at the event in Houston and she and I have become very close from that moment forward. Um, her words to me when I was heading here, she messaged me and she said, sis, go do what needs to be done. Um, and so this, this space is very sacred. Last year, February 16th, 2022, I was diagnosed at 33 years old with stage 3B triple negative breast cancer um, overnight. And I place emphasis on overnight because especially at a young age, when you come in with a, a self-discovery, there is a knee-jerk reaction to dismiss um, and say, oh, they're cis. Do you have children? I did, I have two little girls at the time who were three and six. Oh, did you breastfeed? They're probably cis, you're too young. Um, and I had to push a little bit. I did, by the grace of God, get an appointment with MD Anderson and went through a diagnostic six hour intake appointment. And my first ever mammogram was a diagnostic mammogram. And I left that appointment with a stage 3B diag. And I think just because of the professional work that I do, I'm accustomed to digesting things that don't taste very well and making them more palatable for the masses and communicating out um, unhealthy and not nice information. And so I had to figure out how, I'm gonna, how am I going to season this information and take it home to my family who was in anxious, anxious wait. When I found the lump in my breast in the shower three weeks prior, I, I knew it was cancer. And I am adopted, so I had no medical history and I had no encounter with breast cancer outside of my aunt um, in my forever home. I, my Aunt Dini, God rest her soul, passed to breast cancer. And 
I was away at college when she went through her journey, so I did not interface with what the treatment looked like or had done to her. So I did not, I didn't know where to begin. And when I met with my care team, the beautiful thing about MD Anderson's approach to intake is it is tribe and fire from day one. And so I was able to sit around the campfire with my onco, with my MP, with my radiologist, who I wouldn't see for the next almost nine months, with my breast surgeon, and sit down and powwow and teamwork. Okay, what is the scope and sequence going to look like? How are we going to win this? And out of their mouths, they offered me a clinical trial in that meeting. That's unheard of. That's really unheard of, so I wanna honor that because that is a part of the legacy work that I'm looking to continue is introducing and bringing clinical trials into the language of the very first conversation. And because I'm a Sagittarius and a risk taker, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, let's do it. That sounds fun, right? I had to make light of this situation because it, it, it's very dark and morbid, and, and when I found the lump in the shower, I had already, um, so important. Uh, I didn't want to cut you off because you were saying some really powerful things, but I want people to understand that this is a legacy we have to create in this moment, one of hope and one of exhumation and one of upliftment and, and of legacy. And so I'll let you finish sharing what you were talking about because you're, you're just so good at this, yeah, sharing your story and speaking. You. you have a gift. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I am a believer, and there, there was a moment in, in the trial, no one promised me that it would be easy, nobody could even promise me that it would work. And so there was a moment where I had to take a stock of myself and my faith and wonder why, of course, I wondered why I went through the cycle of, you know, how could God take his hand off my life, all the things. and. Um, I tend to not think about the thing because then I will um, bury myself in it. And I went through the day to day, I got up, I went to my treatment, I went to uh, my combo chemo, which was the active part of the trial at the time. It wasn't, air, it, had, it was entering phase two of the experimental drug pembrolizumab. So I did Taxol, I was prescribed 16 rounds of Taxol, a lumpectomy if the clinical trial worked, and then 30 rounds of radiation. I did 13 of those um, chemos and I will tell you why. So I did 12 Taxols, every third week I would do Taxol, uh, Paclitaxol, Pembrolizumab, Carboplatin, um, and I was able to make it through three rounds of the Pembrolizumab. I had every single adverse effect that was on the books. I um, would be remiss if I did not mention the one hour consultation I got with my oncopharmacist. That's also unheard of. I was educated very thoroughly. I do not have a medical background, but I was educated very thoroughly on the, the drugs I would be consuming. And we were able to pivot off of the pembrolizumab early because um, by that time it had taken my mobility and I was in a wheelchair, I could not walk. And we concluded that the neuropathy had touched my spine. So with just three rounds of the pembrolizumab, my tumor had shrunk to 97%. And so we had great success with that. I had a moment when I was going through all of these adverse effects, 3 a.m. in the morning, my daughter's um, came in the bed with my then husband at the time, and we slept together. My, my daughters, I think, had developed a sense that if they took their eyes off me, when they came back, I would be gone. And so everyone was finally asleep, and in that dark, dark hour, I had made peace with not being here, and I was tired. I had gotten to a place where I actually didn't want to continue. I wanted to stop my treatment. And I drafted a message in my chart to my team to ask to be taken off my chemo. And it, it was the one time I heard God in that journey. He spoke to me without me even beginning the conversation. And he said, Christina, but remember, remember Hezekiah, just ask. 
I gave him 15 years. You haven't asked me. You have buried yourself, and I haven't said that that is your story. Just ask. And between that moment, there was a switch. And I have I hadn't told anyone, but I had actually bought the dress I wanted to be buried in and had it hanging in my closet with a note in Jeremiah 49, 11, because I knew my mom would know where to look. And I did not have to wear that dress. <laughs> I'm so, I am so grateful to God I did not have to wear that dress. I am so grateful to all of the minds in this room and the ones who are not, who come together and, and sacrifice th their bodies, their minds, their intelligence, their ideas to develop drugs that save lives because um, I am a living organism that is here because of an, an experimental drug. And there are people who are benefiting from that drug to this day. Um, and I'm grateful. And I will close with, I was able to end my, my chemo early because of the wonderful pathological response that my tumor had to the chemo. I did have a breast conserving surgery because of that clinical trial. I had a lumpectomy and I did go through the 30 rounds of radiation, but I walked away 100% pathologically cancer free. And I Amen. will tell you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and lastly, I hold on to um, just faith, right? I'm gonna tie this in really quickly. Faith in circles. I look at um, how my faith was before cancer, and it went from a, a line very linear to, to circles. And I remember, I'm reminded of the story of the paralyzed man because I, I was essentially without my mobility. And his friends walked him for miles, for hours and hours and hours and hours to where Christ was teaching. And when they got there, the room was packed. He couldn't get in. They had carried him miles and miles and miles and miles. And imagine getting there and you can't get in. And he said, cut a hole in the roof and lower me. They're like, dude, we're tired. What are, you, what are you even saying? We have indentures in our arms, we're tired. And eventually they climbed up that roof. And you all are the ones that are climbing on that roof. And with tired arms, with tired minds, with tired bodies, with people who sacrificed themselves and did not see it, what, their bodies were not able to see it through. You all are cutting that hole, that circle in the roof and lowering us down. Because now you saw me walk onto this stage not by my own might, and I'm grateful for that. And with Mima, I look at her name and I, I look at that Carmel all the time. And I say, wow, I'm a literary person. I say, wow, that is so close to karma. I wonder why God gave her the name Carmo. And God said to me, you know, because her goodness comes in a circle. I love you. I'm really at a loss for words, but you're extraordinary, Christina. Your story, your heart, and um, uh, you know, I always say that when we're what we do, whatever we're doing, Tiger Lily, anything we're doing, we open with prayer for a reason. And it's about sacred space. It's not about just the work. It's about heartbeats, and it's about people, and it's about God and the universe, whatever you call it. It's about it's about heart and connection. I do think that we know when I ask God too, why, why, why? And when I say that the the, the path you've been on in my my diagnosis and yours were two weeks apart, same disease, subtype, same disease, staging, and when I kept asking God, why am I here? And then I would hear the words karma, like. And that's why one of my quotes I'll give it when I talk today at the ball, my major quote in life is service is the rent we pay for a living. Service is the rent we pay for our lives. And that's what you do, and that's why I believe God has me still alive. Twelve years past my death sentence day. Okay. Um, and so I, I know I'm looking at Chris and him, you know, just thank you for being here, Chris. I know it's not easy. You know, I know that, you know, for many of us who asked ourselves, why me in the beginning, and then we're here, and then there's someone like Lori, you're like, well, what, what, what happened? She had the access, she had the treatments, and then, 
you know, but as you talked about with Hezekiah, someone had to carry that person as they're going through all the, she's doing all the right things, the surgeries, the treatments, the trials, and, and someone is carrying her. We often see the patient and what they're going through, but that person is watching the patient that's with them, and he and I talk quite a bit. Um, I have the utmost respect for you, Chris, and what you do, and that in the past, maybe Lori up here and you in the crowd, because we always come to all the events, you'd be in the crowd, now you're in her seat. And I just want to honor you as a caregiver and a loved one for what you do and for being present for this role, because I know it's not the easiest. You're still in, you're still in it, you know? Um, but can you share from the caregiving perspective, you know, what it's like being with a partner, supporting her through the clinical trial, what caregivers want people to know about? And I have talking points here, but that's irrelevant now. I want you to share Chris and what Chris and Lori and what that was like and what you want people to know about the importance of supporting a partner. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, no apologies here. We've done a dozen of these events and I still don't, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I still don't know how Lori did it because uh, she did, I don't know, 100 events like this a year practice surgery, thought, and fought cancer herself. Um, and like you said, I, I know, and then, and I apologize to see people, uh, you see me reaching for my phone and taking pictures and stuff, I'm not. Um, <coughs> so, um, the reason I, I do this even though, unlike Lori, I'm not a natural at it, is because of something she used to say all the time, and um, those of you who know her well, you know her little mantra was, uh, <coughs> have I been a blessing to someone today? Sorry. Um, <coughs> so I'm trying to carry on that legacy. Uh, uh, and it's funny because uh, Christina talk, talks on so many points. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if that's going to help, there, but thank you. <laughs> um, and some of the points, uh, like you talk about God and faith, and uh, Mama talked about, uh, you know, the you know the whole thing about why things happen. I mean. Like she was talking about, if anybody had access to the best care, was her. And uh, when she was diagnosed the first time, I had told her, you know, here we go, I'm going to get back on point as far as the caregiver thing, that uh, she was uh, <clears throat> super concerned about others. That, that was her whole life. And so, me as a caregiver, I had to make sure that everything I did was about taking care of her because while she preached to people about you gotta take care of yourself first before you can take care of others, you know, like they tell you on the airplane, she wasn't the best at taking care of herself. <laughs> so when she was diagnosed the first time back in uh, 2013, um, I told her, I, I know you, care very much about your Howard University family and all that, but um, <coughs> I'm telling you right now that um, we're going to go to wherever we need to go to, to, you know, take care of you. And if it's Howard, great, but, you know, I also know that there's other places and you know about other places. So, um, so to bring it full circle to my talking points is, uh, uh, you have to be your own advocate, and uh, as a caregiver, you have to be an advocate for them. Sometimes even the most educated and knowledgeable person in the field like Lori was needs to be um, uh, redirected to make sure that uh, they're doing the best for themselves. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, MD Anderson, so we went to MD Anderson, we went to Johns Hopkins, we went to uh, 
Dana Faber, um, um, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and Sarah, who will speak later on. I always, always got to bring her up. Um, she was instrumental in Lori um, living longer um, after a second diagnosis. The, the first diagnosis, uh, I mean, I kind of hate to say this, but I'm, uh, those that know me, I'm brutally honest. And that's why Lori never gave me a mic. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know she's rolling her eyes right now. Uh, um, so the first diagnosis, it, it, it was easy. I, I, I'm a man of faith and I'm uber positive and optimistic, which is why you see me so choked up now because I truly believe she was um, going to survive it again and outlive me. Uh, but God had a different plan, uh, which is why faith is important, which as strong as mine used to be, he became very weak over the last year after uh, he took her. Um, but, um, sorry, going back and forth. The second diagnosis, um, you know, he mentioned about the dress and um, Lori outwardly was also very positive, like me. In the house, actually, I was the more positive one. So um, when she got the second diagnosis in January of 2019, and the doctor left the room and it was just me and her, she told me, she said, I'm gonna die. Uh, that's something she never said publicly or admitted, and I know right now, once again, she's rolling her eyes at me for sharing the private information. Um, but at the time, like I said, I was still my uber positive, so without thinking, my response to her was, we're all gonna die. I'm gonna die, you're gonna die, but it's not up to us, it's up to God when that happens. Um, and she started laughing. <laughs> And she said, that's why I'm married. Uh, anyways, the diagnosis at the time wasn't good. Uh, it was metastasized, it was in her bones, her uh, liver, organs, and uh, something she, I don't think she shared, nobody else seemed to have known at the time, is that the diagnosis was about six months to a year tops. And while she did eventually pass, like I said, I was in January 2019, and she just passed October of last year. So um, God's plan did include three extra years from what the original diagnosis was, and that was all thanks to trials, and that's why I'm personally grateful to Sarah, because even though one time when we were driving, uh, we took long trips, and you know, as super busy as she was, these were my um, quality time with my wife, uh, apart from when we were asleep. Um, and Sarah interrupted one of those calling her, and I was uh, secretly a little bit annoyed that uh, Lori took the call. Like Mama said, too, she had to hide from me when we were on vacation to, you know, talk to patients and other people, you know, what we're supposed to do in our time. But Eventually, I became very grateful because I realized that uh, the goals and the plan that Sarah and Lori had was to have her go from trial to trial to, to hopefully she was cured or, or you know, extended her life and uh, definitely extended her life. Um, another thing that Christina said that reminded me was the side effects. And she did quit on a trial that was extremely successful at um, killing the cancer within her body. However, the side effects were such that she couldn't continue to practice at the time. You know, she was a surgeon or professor. And for her, um, if the quality of life wasn't that where she could be helping others, then, um, and I like the expression people use, and I been paying more attention to it lately, the thriver expression, because uh, she wasn't looking to survive, she was looking to thrive. And uh, uh, while she's not 
physically heal with us. She is in spirit and all the people that continue to carry on her legacy uh, and, uh, and thrive she did um, during her whole career, but especially the last three years. Um, okay, sorry, I, I need to get to this point. Um, so it's important to have a partner, to have somebody to support you and, like I said, to advocate with you. Um, and um, redefining caregiving. Um, somebody had asked me in another event about um, what I did with caregiving and, and because a lot of times people think about, you know, just taking them to the doctor's appointments with Laurie kept driving herself, but to other things she liked me to be her chauffeur. Part of the reason why she had so much energy to spend, you know, at the hospital and things like that is because she had not done laundry since 2014. <laughs> um, I kind of like this, you know? She yeah, had you on, no. She I, had your little bell for you, right? <laughs> I was, I, I, well, that's, that's the magic of the phone, right? <laughs> I, I can uh, show you the text, but, um, but yeah, but I, I was only happy to do things like that. And then it's funny because especially with somebody as accomplished as she was in the field, cancer is like, it's very little I can contribute. Somebody asked me the other day uh, when I was talking about her diagnosis and, and um, for those who have seen the documentary, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, which uh, she was featured on, we were featured on, she talked about she knew immediately, like you said, um, that she had cancer even before the biopsy in one breath. But the surprise was she had two different types of cancer, the triple negative in the left breast and a different type of cancer, the right breast. And somebody asked me, and I honestly couldn't remember what was the other cancer, the original in the breast, because <laughs> she knew everything. so my job as caregiver wasn't necessarily to know about medications and all that. I remind her, you know, take your medications and rest and this and that. But um, one of the notes I took earlier today um, is about becoming myself more educated if I'm gonna, as I continue to do this of trying to carry her legacy. So uh, uh, I don't sound so clueless at times as far as her medications and her treatments, but uh, but the main thing is, uh, you know, just to be there and to be an advocate. And um, another thing I remember that was key um, during her double mastectomy, the first time before cancer, uh, when she was in the room recovering, you know, a couple hours after surgery, um, she told me about some pain in one of her, um, in her chest cavity. Now, granted, uh, well, you can tell by the picture, but she was tiny, especially compared to me. And, but she was the toughest. I, I, I used to be a kickboxer and practice martial arts. I thought I was tough till I got to realize how tough my wife was. So, so she never complained about pain. You know, we all stomp our toe on furniture and we start jumping around. She stomped her toe and just kept walking. Um, so when she says something about pain, I knew it was really bad. So she, she was like, eh, I got a little pain on my chest, but eh, no big deal, because that's what she always said about herself, no big deal. So when the surgeon came to check in, I said, uh, doctor, there's something wrong with her breast. Now, granted, the surgeon was Dr. Giuliano. He's the mother and father of uh, breast surgery, breast cancer surgery, uh, and uh, he was one of the Lord's mentors, you know, when she was at John Wayne Cancer Institute. So, you know, there's two surgeons and they're both talking and I'm just the dumb engineer in the room. Um, so I pull him aside, I say, she got some pain. And he's like, oh yeah, she mentioned it, but you know, that's normal after surgery, you have pain. So I'm like, no, Dr. G, you don't understand. Lori never complains about pain. So if she says a little pain, most of us will be screaming. So I think you need to check. It's like, 
Uh, we will go ahead and check it out, whatever, but they were both kind of trying to be dismissive in her. As it turns out, she had some internal bleeding going on. So they had to take her back to surgery. Um, and then Dr. G the next day told her, you know, your husband basically saved your life because you were like, ah, no big deal. And I was like, ah, no big deal. So that's what a caregiver does, uh, you know, that even when the patient is uh, dismissive or not feeling like taking the meds or not, you know, feeling like eating right. I couldn't get her to stop drinking Coca-Cola, but <laughs> otherwise, you know, you, you have to help them even when they don't want to be helped, you know. Um, and that could be, like I say, anything from talking to their doctors, not saying do it behind their back, but um, talking to the doctors to um, doing the laundry. Uh, You're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to. As I see, Lori would not let me mirror mic. Yo, yo, keep doing this. Um, oh, yeah, I know this one is a good one. Uh, okay, uh, as great as doctors are in healthcare, and I'm glad you had a wonderful experience initially at uh, MD Anderson. Um, ours was, you know, one time it was great, the other time wasn't as great. Um, you have to be your own advocate. I know I've said this before, a lot of people said it, but um, something I had mentioned in, in uh, Lizzie wrote down, she did a great job with these notes, is that uh, you got to remember that doctors, uh, well, the healthcare system is still a business. E everything is a business. Now, you all heard in the introduction, I'm a business owner, so I'm not knocking down businesses. But you have to realize that ultimately, they're not necessarily going to always tell you what's best for you. Uh, they will, but they also are looking at that bottom line. So when it comes to healthcare and going to MD Arnison, Job Hopkins, Howard University, you know, wherever, um, the first thing they're going to tell they're, they're, what they're not going to tell you the first thing is to go someplace else to find a trial or a different treatment. They're going to try to say that all the answers are where you're at. And that's not the case, you know. Um, it's no different than, you know, going to Baskin Robbins. They're not going to send you to Cold Stone or vice versa. They're going to tell you they have all the flavors and anything you need there for ice cream. But those of you like me who love ice cream know that there are differences <laughs> when you go to different places, even if they're called the same flavor of ice cream. So it's the same thing with the treatments, you know. Um, we will go to one place and they tell us all this, this, and that, um, especially a second time when our diagnosis wasn't uh, great. So we had to basically hunt down our own t different trials. The other thing too is that, um, going back to equity, um, like Mema said early in the earlier panel, and some of you, um, we're way behind the disparity still, the gap between the treatments available for African-American women and uh, non-Indian speaking women versus um, the majority in this country. Um, so we need more black women and minorities and black men to, to, to participate in these trials. And I know historically, going back to Tuskegee, they have not done us right, but I, you know, I'm here to tell you even though things aren't perfect, they have definitely progressed. There's definitely people now uh, heavily involved with the trials, such as Dr. Horton, that can help you navigate that and get to the right place, so you, you gotta try. Um, the treatment that, uh, that I was talking about that, that did wonders for Lori, but she had to quit because of the side effects, uh, like you say, it's now have become standard of treatment and I feel ashamed I can't think of the name but they do the commercial I see the commercials now and I'm very happy that while it didn't work for her as she wanted it to work meaning beyond the cancer just the side effects um, 
I know he's helping other women out there. And um, the other point is that, that uh, and it's kind of funny because people have asked me about her trials and the reason I haven't memorized all these things is because one of the things she was big on was uh, personalized care. So what works for somebody might not work for somebody else. So as much as you do want to get information from others, you can assume that, you know, the treatment is going to work for you. So you have to go to different places and, and get that personal, multidisciplinary um, approach to your care. Thank you, Chris. Can we give him a hand? I think Lori's very proud of you. She would give you the mic today. She would have been happy you had the microphone. Um, it's, it, you just, you're so, um, you are a great partner to her. You are a good partner to her now, and I'm sure she's just watching, smiling, and winking at you. And um, I'm proud just watching, because he would always hide in the back of the room, way in the back, so you wouldn't call him up. And just having you sit here and talk is just, um, it's beautiful, thank you. Um, I was gonna go to Kendall next, but I think, well, be before I go further, one of the things that Chris has taught me, even um, when, as Lori was in transition, just in the, at the end, she would be texting and texting, at some point he took the phone away from her. And he's like, it's me, I'm texting now because she ain't texting no more. Like, I'm in control, she's not working, because she'd take the phone and start working, and he's like, I got the phone now, so I would text him and be like, how's she doing? Um, but he would always say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Yeah. I'm blessed and highly favored. And I was like, what? You know, I didn't expect that from him. And up until, it's going to have to extend more than 10 minutes. <laughs> Just FYI, love you guys. I, c I could not stop the, the, the beauty happening. But thanks, Shonda. They're my timekeeper, by the way. But I'm the boss, so I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> pull some boss moves a little bit. <laughs> um, he was saying, I'm blessed and highly favored. And so I just feel like, that's something that really has stuck with me. People ask me how I'm doing, and no matter what, I say I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. Because as long as you're breathing and your heart's beating, and even if you're not breathing or it's beating, the legacy that you're being that you're created, you've created, is a blessing, and that blessing is highly favored. And so, as you all who are in treatment or you're doing research in science and clinical trial, whatever you're doing, just think about how do we relanguage the work that we're doing. To be in this space is a lot of work, but we're blessed and we are highly favored to be alive and doing this beautiful legacy-driven work in this moment. Um, I want to go to Sarah, because you are one of Lori's best friends, and you watched this happen, all that she went through, and you're in the work with her, and you're carrying that work forward through, as Chris talks about, you know, having the right treatments and looking at the levels of being, uh, the, 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 the drug toxicity level and how it impacted patients. And so talk about your perspective as a doctor, as a friend, um, and what you're doing in the clinical trial space to, because you know one of the things he said that she stopped treatment was because it was too toxic for her to be in, and she chose quality of life over extending her life because she couldn't tolerate it. How are you helping to advance the trials to space so that that doesn't happen as much with black women? Okay, is, is, yes, this is on. All right, so um, first I have to say, <laughs> Chris. <Right. laughs> I've, say, I've been sitting up here with Chris a lot talking about uh, breast cancer. It's been wonderful to have this um, continuation of Lori um, with me talking about breast cancer and helping to um, do some outreach and education. And um, so, yeah, so thank you for being up here, Chris. I love hearing your stories. There's always something new about Lori. Uh, so Lori was the surgeon to our um, group at Howard, and I was a medical oncologist. So we worked very, 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 very closely. And we became very, very, very good friends because it was like a family at Howard. Because just like um, any situation where sometimes you have to work a little harder because you don't have everything in place. So the two people have to make sure that, and for us, it was our patients did not fall through the cracks. Even though at Howard, we were a little under-resourced. We didn't have as many nurses. We didn't have as many navigators. Uh, we have one amazing navigator. What we did as a team of physicians was we kept in constant contact, our radiation oncologist, Jackie, Dumb worked with us. Um, and our patients were like our family. And Lori and, uh, was like a sister. And um, that we called ourselves partners in crime. 
So every time we had a patient, that was our, that was our touch challenge. Um, and so when Lori was diagnosed with breast cancer, and like you said, Chris, uh, she was just, you know, she kind of, as an aside, once told me, you were working on patients, and you know, and then it comes out, she has breast cancer, and she had it, and you know, two different kinds of breast cancer, so we're working all of this out in our head, but she was always moving forward, taking care of patients. And one of the things that frustrated me the most in all of her treatment was what you said. She was on a clinical trial, and as physicians were like, is the drug working? Is it working? It was working in her. But she was having side effects. And it was just, we, would, we tried everything. I was in the books going back to, you know, tinctures, you know, anything that anyone had tried for that side effect that we've got a million drugs for, but weren't working for her. It wasn't working for her. And, and it truly did um, impact her quality of life to the point that she needed to leave the study. Um, whereas I would be like, okay, I'm gonna stop my job and I'm gonna just sit at home and be sick. But what you said is that's surviving and she wanted to thrive. She wanted to continue to help people. Um, so that being said, and the question you asked me, Mama, is about what are we doing about side effects? So um, in my career, a, a big bulk of it, 15 years, uh, was taking care of patients at that level. Um, but then I went to the FDA, because I said, you know, how can I uh, best impact um, getting our women on study? Because that's one thing, even at Howard, we had a small clinical, I was the director of clinical trials, I was like, let me do this when I first came there, but we didn't have the resources to provide clinical trials safely. And you have to be able to do science safely. We can't give people, you know, drugs that we don't really know their side effects in a way where it's not being monitored um, incredibly carefully. And that's the beauty of a clinical trial because once a person is on it, they're not only being given innovative, new, novel therapies first, they're also being monitored like crazy. So if anything is going on in your body, you're getting scanned more, you're getting seen by docs more, you know how hard it is to get into a doc sometimes. You have access to, to caregiving um, in, a, in a much higher level. So. Uh, just because of that, you know, I think that it's, it's so unfair that there's a popu uh, part of the population that doesn't have access to this, like someone said, because of their zip code. Um, so, when I, so when I went to FDA, I kind of focused on uh, the breast cancer drug, and I'm seeing all these studies come through and side effects and how we deal with it. Um, and one of the things that Lori and I both agree, and a lot of people agree, that personalized medicine is going to be the future of our treatment. We're identifying targets on these cells, and everybody has different targets on their cells, so it's, it's not all breast cancer, it's not all black women have this, it's you as an individual, and your life experiences and, and what you've been exposed to in life determines what's on your cells. And so personalized medicine is more targeted, which is our hope, less side effects. We're seeing less side effects, we're seeing different side effects, because our immune system is involved when, when you do that. Uh, but all of that to say is science is moving forward. And the people who are educating us about what's going on with these cancer cells are the patients in the clinical trials. And if we don't have representation in those clinical trials, we won't know, um, we won't benefit from those drugs first. And it may be that we've got something on our cells that are targetable, but no one will ever know because no one uh, in, a, in a research position has ever seen that. And so um, one of my big focuses is whatever position I had at the time, and I've had a lot of different positions in medicine, is to try to um, find ways in that position to get more underrepresented populations on clinical trials. Um, and, and I can talk for other people. No, this is really great. It ties into what Kendall will talk about next. And I wish we had more time. There's so much to say here. Um, but we're gonna get kicked out at some certain times, so I wanna get through all these amazing speakers. Kendall, you're, you at, you're at Walgreens, and you're talking about um, clinical trials with intention is what you're building. To Laurie's point and Chris is like, how do you build trials to reach your communities where they are in a way that's gonna uh, you know, encourage trust, um, relatability, like Christina said, people are comfortable, they're getting their needs, their human needs met mm -hmm. um, while getting the right medicines. What are you doing at Walgreens? 
as part of the Boots Alliance to make this happen. So then we'll hit, we'll hit, not hit, we'll <laughs> go to Neha <laughs> next. So first, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, at the panel prior to this one, as well as each of you individually and collectively, I feel a sense of inspiration um, and energy to continue to do the work where I've always had that energy and it, and it was my own personal experience that led me to the work. So what I'd like to start with for you is, if you can, take the idea of Walgreens as a retail pharmacy and put it over here for a minute, just for a minute, and empty your mind and thought about going to the pharmacy of any pharmacy and picking up a prescription. Just put that to the side for a minute. Because what you started with and what each of you has spoken to is who are we as people and what have the choices been that we've made and what decisions can we make in the future? And so for me, there's always an origin story, one of the pieces of my origin story. At nine years old, my uncle called, I was in the fourth grade. He told me my mother was leaving. She would be in the hospital, not to contact her, and someone will show up at the house. Fast forward. I was a freshman in college. My parents had been divorced from the age of nine forward. And my mom and dad said, we're going to have a family meeting. Family meeting? as in together. My dad was diagnosed with non-small cell adenocarcinoma, a type of lung cancer. My parents asked us to commit to not dropping out of school to go and take care of him, but that she would be there for him. Their divorce. I spent the last 25 years working in the pharmaceutical industry as a person looking for answers because I was thrust at an early age into figuring things out, into understanding what just happened and what power and agency I had to affect the change that I wanted to see. So I was called to task at an early age, and that has stuck with me. My career in the pharmaceutical industry was on the clinical development medical affairs side, so I would talk to key opinion leaders and academic institutions about their ideas and needs for continuing medical education and professional development for healthcare professionals, as well as investigator-initiated clinical trials, doctors who do research and are both serving the needs of their patients clinically, but also studying investigational products in order to be on the cutting edge of the horizon about what's coming in the future, such as personalized medicine. So I left a job that I loved after 13 years. I probably would have stayed there another 13 years. But in December 2021, my mom went from being okay one day to the next day not being able to walk, talk, toilet, any of the activities of daily living. And I had another decision to make continue forward on my privileged path of having a job of my dreams, or go check on my family and make sure that I don't take my foot off the gas. The decision was already made. I needed to see about my family. Someone called and said, two months later, there's this lady and she's always talking about the same things you're always talking about. I think you guys should meet. And it was the chief trials officer for the Walgreens Clinical Trials Division. And she was building an organization within Walgreens to address inequities in clinical trials. What? My first year in that wonderful job that I came from, we had a drug in phase three for type two diabetes that enrolled fewer than 100 African-American and Hispanic patients in a trial of over 4,000 lives. How do you think you're gonna come to the market with a product for type two diabetes when there's a higher prevalence of disease in black and brown communities? I don't understand. <laughs> what can I do to help? I'm called to task. I said, well, I'm not just gonna talk to my boss <laughs> because that's a chit chat between the two of us. That's not scalable, that's not gonna fix the problem. I'm a problem solver and I'm called to task. We are all called to task and invited. It's the choices that we make. 
about how we are going to respond when we are called to task. So I took our job postings and I deleted all of the content and I started from scratch. And I came in the next day and I said, here are the critical success factors and here are the key performance indicators. And if you want to know how to not have that outcome in the future, then you're going to have to put some money and people behind this. Not just talk to me as the N of one, because in medical affairs there's often an N of one, and those in the room probably know what that means. So from that opportunity, and in the opportunity to take the job that I came from, which, oh, by the way, that set of critical success factors and key performance indicators became my job 10 years later. In part because as we are getting further into personalized medicine and the use of digital health technologies become, is becoming ubiquitous, not only in our personal lives, but both in clinical practice and in clinical research, those tools that we now know of because of the pandemic, like doing a telemedicine consultation, having apps on our phones, being able to wear a device that has sensors and can transmit information to our providers in real time so there aren't delays in the care that we need, is revolutionizing our space. And so I took my dream job, oh, that I designed, and I had been working on a new job description because the pandemic opened the floodgates on all of what was just being talked about in life sciences. We can't just talk amongst ourselves as professionals. We have to invite everybody <laughs> to the conversation, and they have to have agency and a vocabulary and confidence in speaking with those with education and experience in order to keep going in that journey. I joined the Walgreens Clinical Trials Division last year. This team is growing to now over 60 people from an N of one, the Chief Trials Officer. And I have a line of leadership that looks like me for the first time <laughs> in my career. How that is shaping what Walgreens is doing is to be able to first put certified clinical trials ready sites in communities across the country. Why? Starting with the fact that there are 9,000 locations across the country. And oh, by the way, 7,000 of the 9,000 locations have a private health room. Just like we go to our doctor's offices and have our privacy and our dignity maintained. During the pandemic, we saw on the front lines people losing their lives disproportionately and people hospitalized disproportionately, a threefold higher mortality rate among people of color and a fivefold higher morbidity rate of hospitalizations. And at the time, our CEO said, I think we can do something about that. She was called to task and rallied all of Walgreens to now strategic partners that include at-home care providing services through CareCentrics. Why? Because some people can't get to the, oh, 80% of the country is within five miles of a Walgreens. Even that short distance, because the barrier to access means that, you know what, it could be two hours away. And if I have to leave my job and take care of my kids and my responsibilities in order to go to the site, not one, but multiple times over the course of a study, nah, son. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> That's yeah, inconvenient for a lot of people. And so even if you want to volunteer for a clinical trial, it isn't easy. It's not. And so our CEO and our leadership have made strategic partnerships so that we can activate our locations and bring the opportunity, the education, so that communities come away from the experience empowered for the change that they want to see. And I'll stop. Amazing, that was church. <laughs> so Neha, that was amazing. You have the, the, the task of now summarizing all the great work that Sijin does in the space in your next three minutes. Thank you. I'm in trouble now with my team for being, but I just couldn't stop the conversation. I mean, who could have stopped this conversation? No, Nobody. It, it, we didn't need to stop it. It was a truly transformative experience to sit on the stage. It was such a privilege to be here and be in this space. And 
just being a small you know, drop in the ocean of work that you're doing for good. So thank you for including me in this conversation. Thank you for being here. You know, I've, I've reflected a lot on the title of our, our panel, you know, what Nirvana looks like. You know, what does Nirvana look like? What does Nirvana mean, you know, for BIPOC patients and clinical trial participants, right? What does this look like? And what comes to me, what kept returning to me is that Nirvana is different for everyone just like our patients have individual needs and individual journeys as we've seen beautifully uh, described and shared today and will continue to. In, in the honor of Dr. Wilson, with caregivers, with Christina, Dr. Horton, and you know, Kendall, all the amazing work you're doing to innovate that landscape. And my job, you know, as a representative of industry, those on the side of clinical trials, we must be, or gain trust. In order to gain trust, we must be trustworthy. And that is, is the fiber of what drives my work in ensuring there is an adequate representation of, of patients of color in our clinical trials. So we set goals and we look at it from a 360 perspective and partner with innovative boots on the ground advocates like Tiger Lily to reach patients according to what Nirvana looks like for them. And that starts with the education and the trustworthy message that comes from angels, that comes from different organizations across the BIPOC spectrum that speak the language, that build that trust through, through various organizations and, and different cancer forums. We build materials, we speak the language, we go to the communities through these trusted avenues, and that's the first layer. But even more than that, it is really curating what the patient's needs are, considering what caregivers may need the transportation barriers, the accessibility from flying from one city to the other. All of those things are important. Not everyone is a, you know, um, party-loving Sagittarius that will, you know, <laughs> sign on to a clinical trial sight unseen or have the privilege of a, a sister and a colleague that can support them through their journey of clinical trial navigation. And so it is through efforts of going to bring our trial to the community where patients are, to expand our strategy and do everything we can to build a bespoke approach. It is just in a high level summary of what CGEN is trying to do in oncology clinical research and pivotal to that. The, the root of that is our work with advocacy and organizations like Tiger Lily. So thank you. Thank you, Neha. Thank you so much. I just want to thank the panel for this amazing conversation. I know that we, Lizzie has been, Lizzie, by the way, if you're watching this virtually or anyone's recording, Lizzie is um, the director of our Center of Excellence for Policy called HEAL, and she helped to orchestrate this today. Um, she talked to every panelist. She's part of every detail. This is part of her, her um, center of excellence, her institute work. But she got sick and couldn't be here. And we put people first. And so we said to her, we're going to make you your own best advocate. You're going to stay home and get better. So I just want to honor Lizzie for making this energy possible um, in prepping the panels. But beyond the prepping sessions, you know, Lizzie, her goal was, as was mine, to let you speak authentically about your experiences. Um, and I just am so floored by the passion and the authenticity and the depth of spirit and the sacredness I feel in this room. It's like really like going to church for me. When I leave these spaces, I feel fulfilled. And I feel full and I feel filled. And so thank you for filling me up and each other in the audience. And um, thanks for all you all do in the community. I, I just know that we always say we didn't choose the club we're in, but it's a club that we never want to leave because of what, who we met in the club. And thank you all for being a part of this special moment and, and time. And um, 
you're now part of our family, all of you guys. Thank you for this time again. And um, I think it's time for lunch now, right? <laughs> Thanks, panelists. Today, she joins us to share her experiences, her insights, and her dedication to advancing healthcare in our communities. Thank you so much for being here. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, I am just going to jump right into it. Um, I want you all to imagine a world where our healthcare systems fully acknowledge, accept, and treat everyone equally. It doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter what your level of education is. In this world, there is no such thing as a social determinant of health. Everyone is invited to live, work, and play in an environment that is healthy and conducive to our well-being. Take a look around you. We can create this world, but it starts right here in this room with us. I'm gonna talk to you about a few things that we can do as healthcare providers and patient advocates to change the trajectory of outcomes for black and brown women fighting cancer. Number one, ask the patient. Listen to them. <laughs> Number two, refer patients to organizations that can help them. Peer support matters. Number three, get to know the patient. Get to know her as a person, not as a patient. I'm gonna briefly tell you a story about a friend of mine. Um, she had noticed some skin changes in her breasts and she went to her doctor and said, hey, uh, can I get a mammogram? Her doctor dismisses her, you're 36. You go home, you know, don't worry about this. You don't have cancer. By the way, my friend's mom uh, died of breast cancer a few years earlier than this experience. So she goes home and she notices that the skin changes is starting to spread. And she goes back to the doctor. Hey doc, I'm really uncomfortable with this. Can I please get a mammogram? So finally she gets the mammogram and she's diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. Luckily for her, she received treatment, chemotherapy, double mastectomy, and radiation, and she is cancer-free right now. But, but what if she wasn't? What if that delay and detection would have cost her her life? Listening to your patient with an open mind and an open heart can be the difference between life and death. Ask the patient and listen to them. Number two, refer patients to organizations that can help them. Fighting breast cancer goes far beyond the physical fight. We're, we're struggling financially, we're struggling emotionally, mentally, and there are so many organizations out here for women fighting breast cancer. As her healthcare provider, you should know what those organizations are and how to refer her to them. Not only that, she should be comfortable enough when she comes into your office, she should be comfortable enough to share her burdens with you. Build that, that uh, relationship. I told my oncologist, I said, we besties. <laughs> this was at my first appointment. We are going to be in a relationship for a long time. I need you to know me. Shake hands with these organization leaders. 
and have that information in your back pocket when your patient comes to you and shares her burdens with you. Peer support matters. Number three, this is my favorite part. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm gonna show you guys some pictures. Um, this is my family, me and my husband and my son, uh, Zion, he was two years old in that picture. This is me um, working as a nurse, bedside nurse during COVID, 2020. This is me uh, doing a Spartan race in Las Vegas, a six mile, 25, 25 obstacle Spartan race. <laughs> This is me and my husband at the same race, completing the race. <laughs> um, and I'm sharing these pictures because number one, we completed this race five months before I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Um, I'm gonna just let, let, that, let that simmer for a minute because I never seen myself as a patient, even as I was going through treatment. This is who I am. I'm not sick, I'm not ill, I'm not frail. At moments I was, because that is what, you know, that is what happens when you're going through chemotherapy and stuff. But I wanna be seen by my provider as that person. And I want my personal goals to be incorporated into my plan of care. Get to know your patient. She is not her medical record number. Her life is not what you see in her chart. Be culturally sensitive and culturally competent. Ask her questions about her family. Ask her questions about her values and incorporate that into her plan of care. Now briefly, I just wanna to touch on what we can do as patients to facilitate this process as well. We have to take accountability for our own health. We need to be prepared with questions before we get to our provider's office. We need to elect our caregivers and assign roles to them. People want to help you, but they need to know exactly what it is that you need. When we are in front of our healthcare providers, we need to be open and honest. If you can't afford to make it to your appointments, let your doctor know. He or she may be able to help you. They may be able to refer, refer you to an organization that can provide resources. But we have to be open and honest. I invite you to ask questions. I invite you to listen to your patients. I invite you to shake hands with organization leaders and be able to provide resources to her when she's in need. I invite you to get to know your patient. Receiving a breast cancer diagnosis is hard enough. Let's do our part as healthcare providers and patient advocates to change the trajectory of outcomes for black and brown women fighting cancer. My name is Jasmine. <laughs> I'm a registered nurse. I'm a Tiger Lily Angel Advocate. I'm a wife. I'm a mom. I'm a triple negative breast cancer survivor. And with your help, I'm a beacon of hope. Thank you very much. Wow. All right. Our journey continues today, so now I'm excited to welcome up our second speaker for this session here, Regina Hampton. Regina, make your way to the stage, please. Dr. Regina Hampton, there she is in that beautiful orange, is the medical officer, co-founder, and interim CEO of Breast Care for Washington, a nonprofit dedicated to providing access to mammograms regardless of the ability to pay. The facility is the first 3D mammography facility east of Anacostia in Ward 8, which has the highest mortality rate 
for breast cancer in the District of Columbia. Dr. Hansen is the Chief of Breast Surgery at Luminous Health, DCMC, the first, another first, breast cancer in Prince George's County, breast cancer center, excuse me, in Prince George's County. She is also a board certified general surgeon who has focused her practice on breast health and breast cancer. Her former private practice, Signature Breast Care, was the first, yet another first, doctor, <laughs> um, was the first breast uh, surgery practice in the county. She is also the past president of the medical staff, the first president in the 40-year history of the hospital. Dr. Hansen was the project director for the Susan G. Coleman $1 million grant that provided mammograms for uninsured women. In addition to her clinical work and acclaims, Dr. Hansen is the co-founder of Cherry Blossom Intimate at Woodmore Town, a bra boutique offering custom prosthetics for breast cancer survivors and undergarments for all body shapes, sizes, and ages. Regina is also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta. I'm an AKA, that's okay. <laughs> and the link, we joke D9, sister. Of note, Dr. Hansen has also been featured in the Washington Post regarding black women and breast cancer. She has been featured in Essence Magazine. She has appeared on National Public Radio, the Russ Parr Morning Show, and the Buddy Check Nines with Andrea Roan. She is recognized as a top doctor in Washingtonian Magazine. She is featured on OWN, Your Health for Breast Cancer Awareness, on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Dr. Hampton, I welcome you to the stage. Is there a mic, you wanna do a mic? Either mic, you can do here, you can do a mic. We're easy. <laughs> you good? Simple. Oh, Hi, go. everybody. Uh, good morning, still morning, afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's been so uh, inspiring to uh, listen to all the stories uh, and especially to hear uh, the story of uh, one of my mentors and someone who trained me, uh, Dr. Lori Wilson. So uh, it's interesting, the whole circle of life that uh, goes around in the DC uh, breast cancer community. Uh, so what I wanna talk about is uh, some of the changes that have come about in healthcare uh, where we're going and how I think you all can and should be a part of that. So as we know in breast cancer care, patient navigation uh, has been uh, really one of the hallmarks and uh, has really transferred to other lines of cancer care, started with breast first. Um, and traditionally it was considered a position that was uh, staffed by nurse, nurse navigators, uh, but now we're starting to redefine that, and you heard the term peer navigator. And so we're really starting to move to that, A, because we don't have enough nurses to go around, because <laughs> we need nurses to do so many different things. Um, and we realize if we can give good training, uh, then we can teach peers and other survivors and even non-survivors to help guide women through that breast cancer journey. And I think that's where a lot of you in this room can be very impactful uh, and helping. And I think it goes to show that you don't have to have a medical degree to be impactful in this space. Um, our overall goal after treating, uh, you know, we all work really hard doing surgery, giving uh, systemic treatment, hormonal treatment, radiation. But our goal is not to have you all be patients forever. Uh, and we know this can be a challenge because um, we know you all feel comfortable with those of us who've been a part of your oncology team, but our goal is to sort of cut the cord a little bit. We want you to come for a social visit but not be stuck in doctor's offices because the reason why we do all this work is because we want you to get back to living. We want you to get back to life. We want you to develop a new normal that's outside of the doctor's offices. Um, and so really realizing that and taking that to heart, and I know uh, it's a challenge and we have these conversations with patients every day, and I think patients feel like, well, if I'm not seeing someone on my oncology team, then you know, I'm falling through the cracks or something is gonna happen. But I think we really have to realize that because of the fewer resources that we have, because 
the uh, number of appointments that we have that are open to serve all women is very limited, and especially after the pandemic, you know, we've lost a lot of really great providers. And so really realizing that those resources are now very limited, we have to really shift care. And that's where the survivorship care plan really comes into play. So the whole point of the survivorship care plan is to uh, not only summarize your treatment, you know, what you went through, what were some of the major uh, uh, successes and challenges of that treatment, but to give a roadmap to your other non-oncology providers, mainly your primary care doctor and or your gynecologist or whoever it is that you get that primary care service from. So the goal of that, that plan is to be able to provide that roadmap to your other providers so that again, we can slowly kind of cut the cord a little bit uh, so that those well women services now shift back to your primary care team. But they still are going to be on the lookout, you know, looking for recurrence, which we hope nobody has, you know, looking for any latent or long-term side effects. But it's really, really important that we make sure that that survivor care plan is done uh, and that we do that, what we call warm handoff to your primary care provider. Uh, and realizing we're still there for y'all. <laughs> you can always call us, knock on our door, and your primary care provider can always come back to us as a resource. But what we're finding in this lower resource healthcare community that we're in is we're really, um, how do I say this? We're sort of being bottlenecked by our survivors. And many of you all now are five, 10, 20, 25, 30 year survivors, which is great. But some of that, uh, those lower resources is really preventing us from getting women in sooner so that they can be diagnosed or they can get that health care that they need. So I think that really is important and I think we need to really communicate that to the survivor community that, you know, we're not really cutting you all off. We really, you know, are, are, are comfortable at this space that we can really try to transfer that care. And that really leads us also when we talk about screening and, and for those of you who still need to have screening with mammography, um, and really trying to shift that from diagnostic care mammograms to screening. And I'll just touch briefly on what that means. So when you go in for a screening mammogram, you're not having any symptoms, you go in, you get your mammogram, you leave, you get your report uh, uh, soon thereafter, usually within a week. A diagnostic mammogram is typically when you have symptoms, a lump, breast pain, nipple discharge, and we've traditionally been using that for survivors in having you all come back for diagnostic care. But again, what's been created is a bottleneck. And so now, unfortunately, we have women out there who may have a lump that could be cancerous or some other symptom. We can't get those women in for four to six weeks. So I think we have to create a partnership in realizing, you know, again, as survivors, you know, we're not giving you any less care. And so I always have to clear up that a screening mammogram, your mammogram as a diagnostic mammogram is no less than my mammogram as a screening mammogram. We still have radiologists who are looking at it and we're now even using AI. And so we're trying to look at how can we use AI to deliver the results quicker. So even if you have a screening mammogram, how can we get that result to you quicker? And the use of AI may help us to do that. And again, I think it's really important for survivors to know that even if we transition you back to a screening mammogram, realize a couple of things. A, um, you're not getting any less care. Uh, B, uh, somebody's still looking at your mammogram, even if it's a screening mammogram. The only difference is you're gonna get your result uh, in a couple days versus getting it right there on the spot. But again, the care is no less, uh, and we're very adamant about that. Um, but also just realizing that we, we have to move to a little different model because it's not fair to have these women who are waiting this long period of time. And again, there are just a lot of challenges in healthcare and so we're trying to figure out how do we best manage that so that everybody gets great care that's very timely. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just important uh, that we um, partner together, you know, we've heard a lot of stories today talking about how uh, women didn't feel seen or heard. I think it's really important that we empower patients and the medical care community that, you know, from a provider standpoint, this is a team sport. 
and, and as patients and survivors, you guys are the center of the team. In fact, the captain of the team. It's no longer the doctors uh, or the nurses who are the captain of the team. We're all really here to work together. Your voice matters. We want to hear from you. And I think we've got to empower patients that if they're in front of a provider who doesn't make them feel like they're a part of the team, they got to go somewhere else. They got to fire that provider, fire that team, fire that hospital, fire that whoever, and, and move on to somewhere where you can get good care. And you may have to interview a couple of folks. I um, mean, I think it's important that, that us in this room, that we really empower patients uh, to be able to advocate for themselves and realize it's okay. And you want someone who's going to embrace that advocacy. So with that, I'll say thank you and uh, keep doing all the great work that you all are doing every day. Pierce Gould, come on up. As the Associate Managing Director of Life Sciences at Press Ganey, Pierce is a seasoned professional who has mastered the art of navigating complex landscapes. Currently, he's at the forefront of driving change in life sciences, where he plays a pivotal role in creating standardized measures of patient experiences in clinical trials. His mission, to solve for retention. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, and provide industry benchmarks all through the lens of patient centricity. Captain of our own team. Before making waves in life sciences, Pierce's journey took him through the intricacies of healthcare, where he supported small privately held businesses with consumer retention, excuse me, consumer acquisition, retention, and satisfaction. Listening, analyzing, thoughtfully communicating clearly, and building trust. How important is that in clinical trials? We can't go there without trust. So Pierce, you said these are not just words. These are your strengths, the pillars on which you build your success. Currently calling San Diego, California home, Pierce Gold brings not just a wealth of professional experience, but a genuine enthusiasm for making a difference in the world of life sciences. Please join me in welcoming Pierce to the stage. introduction, even though I wrote it. <laughs> um, as Kimberly said, I'm, I'm based in San Diego, California. I was telling uh, my friends at, at the table there, I normally don't tell people that because they, they hold it against me, uh, just because my weather is, is better than yours. Um, but I must admit, um, I'm a little bit nervous for two reasons. One, um, as a grown man, it's hard enough to approach one table of beautiful women now I'm approaching 15, so. Uh, the second reason is um, I wasn't supposed to be on the stage today. My boss had a medical condition and so I'm, I, here I am, she said, you're out, you're speaking. Um, and, and so I was questioning myself, I was saying, what can I contribute to this conversation? Um, even at dinner, I'm like, what am I gonna say? How, how am I, you know, what value can I bring? But then I started thinking about um, my family my grandma, who is a uh, survivor of breast cancer, my grandfather, who passed recently from lung cancer, and I thought about myself. You know, I'm a patient, you're a patient. And so the work that we all are, are, are all doing and, and continue to do is, is for me, is for the future. Um, you know, I'm relatively healthy, um, and, and so I'm not reliant on healthcare quite yet, but I will be in, in the future. And, and so, as I said, what we're doing now is really to dictate the level of care in the future. Um, I work for a company called Press Ganey. Has anybody ever heard of Press Ganey in the room? If you wanna give me a hands up. Okay, see a few. So Press Ganey is the leader in healthcare um, in measuring patient experience. And we do this via patient experience surveys. Um, and we've been doing it for a really long time, about 40 years. Uh, we're partnered with about 90% of hospitals and healthcare systems in the United States around 41,000 facilities. 
and, uh, and just to give you an idea of the scale, last year we measured 47 million patients, about three and a half million healthcare providers, and we sent out about a half a billion surveys. Because of those numbers, we're able to quantify items that traditionally are not able to be quantified. Items such as trust, items such as care and respect. And um, a recent study, I'll just, uh, like a little project that we worked on, we're able to really peel back the layers where there are some subpopulation groups that are not feeling like they're being respected. They're not feeling like they, um, you know, feel comfortable asking questions. And we found a facility that we were measuring that was having a really, there was a lot of friction points in, in a certain subpopulation group, the black American community. And we wanted to understand why. They weren't feeling respected. They weren't feeling like they were comfortable asking questions or receiving the information that was being articulated to them. And we dove into it and we realized that there was no black clinicians working at that site, right? Um, and, and so we worked alongside that client uh, with the DEI initiative with the workforce. So starting from the inside out, understanding that workforce engagement directly correlates to patient experience. Um, and, and so we started that initiative. We resurveyed about six months later and we saw an increase in those scores. So those are just the type of projects that we're working alongside our clients with. Now within life sciences, we've, we've identified that there's this really big gap between healthcare and science. And um, the patient is kind of left on the outside when it comes to clinical trial process. And so we wanted to start understanding the friction points and enrollment in a clinical trial going through a clinical trial. And so um, we started with the most important subject in a clinical trial, the patient, right? It's unconventional, isn't that weird to say? But we started with the patient, patient focus groups, many of them. Then we started doing physician focus groups. Only then did we start pulling in industry leaders to understand what they've done in the past, what they're doing today, and what they're really looking uh, to focus on in the future when it comes to patient centricity. So we started a prototype with three vaccines um, studies, about 1,500 participants, and we got an amazing engagement results, about 52% response rate, which is, I would say, double uh, what we've seen in other lines of business. I think in the healthcare, it's about 20%, 14 to 20% response rate. So patients want, want to tell us how they're experiencing clinical trials. Um, we got people coming back to us saying, no one's ever asked us how we felt in a clinical trial, which, which was amazing to us. Um, and so, The industry has to change, right? We, we, everyone talks about patient centricity and, and DEI initiatives, but no one is taking action. And, and one year ago, we had this vision, we talked about this, and, and Press Ganey is uh, you know, uniquely positioned to solve this, um, solve this problem, um, these initiatives as it relates to patient centricity. So we have a pilot going on right now. There's about 15 studies in it. We're accepting studies in the future. Um, and, and we have an industry council with industry leaders getting feedback, understanding where their focus really is, what they wanna see, how can we really create value in this space. And so I invite anyone that has any questions or studies that they wanna learn more about patient experience um, to uh, reach out to me. Um, and and I'll, I'll just leave with one question. And that is, how do we know we're becoming more patient-centric as an industry if we're not measuring it in a standardized fashion. Thank you so much. Yeah? How's it been so far? Have you learned information? Have you learned something new? Are you reinvigorated? Are you inspired? What an amazing morning so far. Thank you all so very much. I feel incredibly honored to stand up here. So I've had some food now, and I'm going to get a little giddy on you. But um, yeah, all right, I was asleep the first half, but here I am. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. As the folks make their way back into the room, please, that would be fantastic. So we hope, back on script now, you have had a rejuvenating lunch and a productive networking session. 
and we are delighted to welcome you back as we continue our journey through the Beacon Symposium. Our next panel discussion is one of great importance. Policy interventions in health equity and models for success. This session delves into the policies and strategies that can drive positive change and create more equitable healthcare systems. To steer us through the upcoming panel discussion, it's my pleasure. I don't even see my moderator. Where is she? <laughs> She's out there trying to eat, so um, let's sing a song instead. I don't know. I don't really do dances or jokes or anything. But, <laughs> but yes, we got the power, you know, so let's be empowered. So, um, Shonda, if you could grab Mema, that would be great because we are on a time schedule. So I'm going to redo that again to steer us through the upcoming panel discussion. It is my pleasure to invite back to the stage our insightful moderator, the captain of our intellectual ship. Please join me in welcoming Mema Carmo as she guides us through the next enriching discussion. She makes her way to the stage. I am going to start introducing you to our next panelist, our next group of panelists, right? So let's start with Rachel Landauer. Rachel, make your way to the stage, please. Rachel is a clinical instructor at the Center for Health, Law, and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School, where she works with partners to advocate for health policy reform. Rachel is especially passionate about building the capacity of community organizations through resource development, trainings, and other stuff, <laughs> other tools to break down silos that affect health outcomes, including between healthcare and social services. Thank you, Rachel. Valencia Robinson, come on up. Valencia Robinson, a dedicated breast cancer survivor, has been unwavering in her commitment to raising awareness of breast disease since her diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer at age 33. She serves on multiple boards and groups, advocating for legislation, research, and well-being, and was awarded the 2019 Grassroots Advocacy Award by the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Congratulations. Valencia is not only a passionate patient advocate, but she's also a trained yoga instructor. Yes, could use some stretching now, right now. Yes, contributing to the well-being of cancer patients through programs like the Tiger Lily Pure Cat Program, free weekly yoga classes. Thank you very much, Valencia. Now we have Yusharia, and I do hope I pronounced that correctly. Yusharia, sorry? Eukarya, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Eukarya Borden, Eukarya serves as the Vice President of Programs and Health Equity at Family Reach, overseeing program development and expansion, including the Cancer Equity Initiative aimed at the most vulnerable cancer populations. With a previous role as Vice President, Health Equity at Cancer Support Community, Yusharia is known for her dedication to ensuring all patients have access to life-saving care, earning recognition in the healthcare community and media, including a Survivorship Today interview, and leading the In Her Shoes campaign by Bristol-Myers Squibb. With 16 years in the oncology field, she's a past president of the Association of Oncology Social Work. As an AOSW fellow, and recipient of the 2023 AOSW Leadership Award in Oncology Social Work. Thank you. I have another one for you. Linda, Linda Murakami. Hi, Linda. Uh, Linda, leading Amgen's Health Equity Patient Engagement and Advocacy Strategy Alliance efforts. Wow. Draws from her early life experiences in a Denver community impacted by environmental health conditions and concerns. Linda is a broad, to champion, excuse me, broad definition of health equity. 
She emphasizes the importance of patient-centric partnerships and collaboration with community groups, working to educate patients and build trust. Their approach includes supporting nonprofit advocacy groups and sharing successful programs with other committees and communities addressing nation, excuse me, address, Okay, addressing uh, health disparities nationwide with a focus on patients in the investigation process and tailoring solutions to meet individual community needs. Without further ado, let's delve into the wealth of expertise that awaits us in this next panel. Naima, it's all Thank you. Thank you, our awesome host. <laughs> host Jess, isn't she lovely, by the way? And Thank you all so much, and thank you for uh, this wonderful and esteemed panel. I'm super excited. Um, many of you may not know this, but I first began my advocacy work in policy kind of by accident. Um, when I first got diagnosed with breast cancer, I began Tiger Lily. I was still working full time and then juggling like part time jobs to fund the organization. And then I would have these talks with God and ask Him, where should I go to do what I need to be doing? I didn't know how to, I didn't know what advocacy was. It wasn't a really a thing that we were taught yet in certain ways, and so I would just pray and say, tell me wh what to go, where to go, who to talk to. And so one night I was sleeping and um, I got up and there was an email open and it was an event that Debbie Wasserman and Schultz was speaking at and I don't do politics, so I'm like, who the heck is this lady? But God is like, you gotta go meet her. I'm like, oh, I can't, I, don't have, I have to go to work in the morning. No, I to be at school and, all, and whatever. So anyway, I kept thinking I have to go to this event. So I ended up taking Noel to school early, Noel's my daughter, and um, the door was still closed. I'm like, you let her in. I gotta go to this thing in DC and it's an hour away, but I gotta meet this person. And I got there and Debbie was talking about um, being a mother of twins and a third child and feeling so torn between her commitment to public policy and helping people to have better lives and advocating for people at the, you know, um, on the government level, level and being a mom. Her kids were in, in, in Florida with her family and she was, um, home on the weekends, but working full, working in, this, in D.C. during the weekdays. And so I walked into that conversation, and when I just left my child at the daycare center two hours early to be able to do what I felt was compelled to my heart to, to do, and so I went to tell Debbie, thank you for being so transparent as a policymaker, and, and she said, what do you do? And I mentioned, I had this thing called Tiger Lily I just started. What is it? And so I told her, and she said, I have to talk to you. Come to my office. I'm like, am I in trouble? <laughs> Am I gonna get, like, what, what did I do? Is it a ticket I didn't pay or whatever? And, um, and literally, like, you know, she's like, what do you do? And um, so we sat there and we began talking and she said, well, you don't have to convince me of what you do. I had breast cancer, I haven't told anybody yet. You're the first person that's not in my family that I've told. And I was like, why are you telling me? I could be on the news tomorrow. And she's like, you're not, I, I checked you out. You're not. And um, we kind of sat there and we had this beautiful conversation um, where Noelle was still little, she was like trashing Debbie's office and there is her staff um, talking, just we're just sitting there talking as the sun set about her policy work and the importance of making something happen that was unique, that was not your usual go do a walk or run or just like, that wouldn't involve patients. And she said, I want to involve patients who are not seen and heard young women who aren't in the room and I love what your ideas are about. And I said, but I'm really, really small. Nobody knows me yet. She goes, they will. And so we kind of, that's how the early act started and she pulled in groups like Living Beyond Breast Cancer and Coleman and the other groups that had a bigger, but we also had a community-based level support, right? So we had community grassroots and they had bigger policy groups. And that's how the Early Act kind of manifested and came to be, which and now has helped millions of women across the country over the past 11 years. That's what policy does. It brought to the forefront the fact that women who are younger can do get breast cancer and the idea came about with two women at the age of like, she was 40 something, just 40 something, and I was 33 or four. And that's helped women's lives who will never know Debbie's name or my name or people that were part of that who are in this room today who've been, who've changed policy that led to the next policy, which is PALS and the other things we've been doing. But um, the power in policies, you can discuss clinical trial work, you can discuss access, you can discuss all these different things, but they won't change if we don't have the community education and the policy interventions. And um, so one of the things I love the most is that we've got to launch our HEAL Center of Excellence last year that Lizzie Wittig runs. And Linda supported HEAL through um, support, funding, so did Mark as well at Glass Pfizer, um, to help us to bring 
women of color, black women who weren't being seen and heard to Capitol Hill. And last month, we brought 21 black women who were in communities that have the highest death rates for breast cancer in black women to Capitol Hill to lobby for the TMBC Act bill to help advocate for funding for research for triple negative breast cancer. And that's the work we're doing through our policy intervention. And so I'm gonna start with Valencia first because she does a lot in policy. Um, and Valencia, can you share a bit about, I mean, you're a yogi, you're a teacher, you're a mama, you're a helper, and you're on Capitol Hill advocating for policy change. Can you share how you got involved in policy and what it's done for you as an advocate? I can. And I'm gonna start off saying that breast cancer is a political issue, right? Every aspect. Every aspect of breast cancer is touched by public policy. And when I was diagnosed, I was a, a classroom teacher. I had a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, and eight-year-old. I was 33. Had no idea how to navigate. But with the help of the Lord, with family support, I had to fire my first doctor, and my second doctor was incredible. And Florida Breast Cancer Foundation is one of the organizations I'm actually on their board. I mean, I'm skipping because I don't want us to run out of time. I'm on their board, right? And it was, people kept asking me, you gotta share your story because so many things happened to you and you're not supposed to be alive. Your oncologist told you you were not gonna make it through triple negative disease, but you're alive, so you gotta share, you gotta, you got to help people. So I started Women of Color Wellness Alliance because it wasn't just breast cancer. It was all gynecologic cancers. I'm helping people who have multiple myeloma, people who are just trying to navigate any diagnosis. So Florida Breast Cancer Foundation, we had, we would go to Tallahassee and we would speak to our um, legislators. We would talk to them about the need there's the Mary Brogan Breast Cancer and Cervical Cancer um, Fund that we need that money for underinsured, for uninsured, for people who don't have Medicaid. We need those funds every year. And we need them to increase those funds. So it started off me, my sister was diagnosed after me. My sister lives in Tallahassee. So my sister and I are doing this thing together. And there's power in a family, talking and sharing about their breast cancer journey to policy makers. So we are just building and I'm talking and I'm speaking and I'm sharing. And then I became a part of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. I was on, I'm on their board. Same thing. We're coming to DC to get the same funds. Here it's, um, it's federal funds for the breast and cervical cancer research program. It's $150 million for the Department of Defense, breast cancer research program. So we're continuing to ask, and I've gone through Project LEAD. I've gone through several types of training, right? So it's not just you get up there and you talk to policymakers. It's science that you have to learn. It's courses that you have to go through. It's 17 years later, that I, I mean, I felt comfortable, especially in Tallahassee. I grew up in Mariana, Florida, small country town. So when I go to Tallahassee and I mention Mariana and my sister's there with me, my aunt grew up in Mariana, Florida. She died of metastatic disease this year. So when you're telling all of these details, they get it. They have family members, so they get it. So it's, it's years of cultivating those relationships because a lot of times it's the same senators and reps and their aides that you're talking to every time. Can you share a bit about the importance of being a black woman and using, having your face and voice represented when you're doing this work? Because we don't often see, I love, I did Project Lead as well years ago. And I was, but I was kind of, I, I, I loved it, but I was intimidated. I didn't know, I was very young, much younger, much younger, I'm still young, but. And um, just, I'm just saying this for a friend. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was intimidated. Everybody was older than me. And, you know, I didn't think color really mattered then, but I just felt like they're older. They're, like, so experienced. They have this, and they felt, they seemed confident. And I felt so intimidated to speak up, right? Um, 
but as I began to be, do my policy work and do my own Hill Day and bring other advocates who were younger and had triple negative breast cancer or who may have been brown or black, I felt community building around me and I felt more confident. So when there are more people that look like you, you're, yeah. you're and we'll ask you this later, about the P, big P and little P, but your power in the space differs, your confidence grows. Share a bit about that part. Well, growing up where I grew up, there's not a lot of people of color. So I was used to sharing. I'm used to being the only person. I'm used to being that one person who can get the point across. I mean, I'm using my educational background. I'm an English teacher. So I had to get over the fear of who's looking and just say, say a prayer and God give me the words to say to these people so that they can understand the urgency of these things, right? And when we went, when I went to Project Lead, there was a shift, there had been a shift. They recognized that there were not en enough people of color and there were a lot of people of color in my class. And so we rallied together and we stuck together and since then I just hear that every year there's more and more and more people of color because I'm on the board. I let them know You're at the table. I'm at the table. Yes, I like it. I love it. Okay, so question for you. Um, we, we talked about in your pre-interview with Lizzie the big P and the capital P in policy. Can you explain what that means and what you do with Shopee, right? Yeah, yes. I love that question. So when we think about big P policy, that's a lot of this really courageous work that you're talking about or that Maimon's talking about of kind of that government, federal, and state level change. And then we can think of examples of that that affect our day to day in the breast cancer space, right? So if you have insurance, then you're able to access mammograms at no cost to yourself under certain conditions, right? That's a law, that's a big P policy. Then we have little p policy, which is more at the organization or department level, and that's also influencing a lot of day-to-day -day policies, a lot of day-to-day -day distribution of resources within an institution and outside of it and their priorities. So you can imagine a board of directors at a hospital saying, we've looked at our data, we've decided that we're still seeing disparities in breast cancer diagnosis, and so we're gonna have a policy that actually, not just is this no cost out of pocket, but our physicians have to ask women about breast cancer screening, about history. They have to listen to women when women show up and tell them that they're not feeling something is right. And so that's more maybe of an institutional little p policy, but I think what's really important for our conversation is that big p policy impacts little p policy, right? It's the backdrop that it's happening against, it's the rules and parameters that it's happening within, and hopefully little p policy also gets fed back up and gets to inform big p policy because we're saying, hey, like black women are still not getting diagnosed early enough. And so our rules that we've put in place about testing, they're not working. And so that feedback loop is really, really important. People's voices do matter. I mean, look at the mammography rules that have been shifting from 40 to 30, you know. I mean, we didn't have, we've been advocating for that for what, 20 something years? When I first began going through this breast cancer journey, why are women getting screened at 30 years old? They're like, we just don't do it that way. And now we're seeing that through years of public policy and advocating and the law wasn't changed, but the guidelines have changed, which gives us a leg up that we didn't have years before, which could equate to women, especially black women, living longer lives, right? And so it's really important to have your patient voice represented at the table, whether it's a big P level or a small P level. And to Valencia's point, you know, um, I, I love living scared. So I do things whether it's scared anyway. So even when I'm out there to advocating, um, where was I yesterday? Someplace talking and someone said, you know, we, we, I, I spoke and I went in the back room to like, I'm an introvert, went to go hide for a little bit. And they said, you're an introvert. I was like, yeah, but when I get on the stage and I'm talking about what God brought me here to do, which is to advocate <laughs> that out, out the door. And so even if you're a shy person, your voice matters, your impact matters. And just like speaking your truth, people don't know what you're going through if you don't tell them what you're going through. And so just sharing your story authentically is what really matters. And people can understand that and feel that 
And that can transform healthcare policy because everybody has a cancer story, a mother, a father, a sister, a friend, a neighbor, you know, somebody has been touched by, and by disease. So we're, we're all patients. And so don't ever think that your voice doesn't matter or your actions don't matter because just you speaking up about what you're going through can save someone's life. Um, yeah. So you care, you're doing a lot of work at Family Reach around um, authentic community engagement. And can you share more about what you do there and why it's so impactful, like why the model's working? Because we're all about solutions today. So what's working, why it's badass, and how can we take that model <laughs> and expand on that? Absolutely, and thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. I love that question. I don't get to answer questions like that. Why is it so badass? I think I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to like put that in. Not just what I want to say, but here's what I want you to ask me from now on. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I'm gonna say that. Um, and so, Family Reach is an organization whose core mission is to alleviate the financial burden of cancer. Now we hear this a lot, right? We do, but. I joined Family Reach in February, and before I got there, they actually changed their strategic plan in a way that I love. Because when we talk about something like financial literacy or the financial burden, it's this big thing. What are we even talking about? Are we talking about co-pays or insurance? Or like, what are we talking about? And that's what they realized, that the conversation itself had just become this nebulous thing. And so we specifically focus on four things food, transportation, housing, and utilities. Why? Because these are the things that make a difference for whether or not someone is gonna be present at treatment. These are the core issues that people are dealing with every single day. I'm an oncology social worker, a licensed clinical social worker in Philadelphia. So I've had the privilege of working alongside patients for over a decade. And I'll tell you, these are the things that people are ashamed to talk about these are the things that folks don't bring up, but when you look into their eyes, you see that there's something else there. And so one of the things that we have going right now is our Cancer Equity Initiative, which has two parts. One is our on-site navigation program in Philadelphia, where we have a navigator on site at four hospitals, where we are an extension of that care team so that our navigator is right there with them. No one has to refer to Family Reach. We are there so that they can say, go see Alima. Alima is there. Alima will process that application and get them the, the aid that they need right then. Because part of the problem sometimes is we give referral, and then what? We don't follow up. We don't see if somebody actually picked up on the other end, yet all of our EMRs, our electronic medical records say, referral made to this place. But what we don't see is what happened. Have they called four times? Because I can tell you, when patients came back to me, they would frequently tell me, no, I haven't had a chance to call them yet. No, I, you know, I tried, but I didn't, get, I didn't get a response, or I just haven't gotten to it. And so it's having that resource available where people need it, when they need it. The other part of that Cancer Equity Initiative is our community partnerships. We are partnered with seven community organizations. Our, community, our Cancer Equity Initiative is specifically focused on black and Hispanic patients because we know that black and Hispanic patients with lower incomes experience the financial hardship of cancer in ways that no one else does. And so we lead with that data. That's why we're there. And so we thought, hmm, you know what? People in black and brown communities have learned over time that systems are not here to protect me, systems don't give me what I need, systems fail me, and so you know what that means? They don't talk about what's going on because how do they know that they can trust that if they even bring up what they're facing that you're gonna do anything about it anyway, right? I see lots of head nodding, you know what I mean. And so in communities where people live, this is where they feel comfortable talking about what's going on. This is where they feel comfortable seeking needs, getting their needs met, and being vulnerable. So we thought, well, why don't we work with them? And so in the same way, we become an extension of the services that they provide, whether that is a cancer organization or not, because even the organizations that are not primary, primarily serving cancer patients are still serving cancer patients, right? And so we are there so that when that person comes in, they can say, you know what, I can meet your need today. 
I can go ahead and process that application right now to get you the aid that you need right now. Whether that patient knows that it's family reach that provided that assistance, that doesn't matter so much. You know, I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own stuff about making sure people know where it came from. That's not what matters. What matters is that they get what they need. This is the important stuff. Because I have to tell you, I had to count early, like how many words is that? I think it's five words. But the five words that are the most chilling to me are the times where I heard patients say to me, I wish I had known. I wish I had known. And they say that to me for so many things. And we don't want that. We want to make sure that people can get there. You know, I remember talking to a patient, um, his wife. He was there for treatment. They had a platinum plan in the marketplace, $1,400 a month. But everything was covered, except he lost his job. He was trying to get unemployment. And even with that platinum plan, I'm sitting there, and the math just didn't add up. And I said, okay, that, that's paid for. He said, the house is paid for. I always wanted to make sure my house was paid for. I said, okay. And as I'm doing little math in my head, I said, but how are you eating? And the wife welled up with tears because it's the question that no one was asking. And that's why Family Reach exists, because somebody's got to ask these questions, somebody's got to meet the basic needs, because this makes the difference for whether someone shows up. You know, statistics definitely show us that people who have financial intervention have a 73% 70, chance of surviving versus 46% of people who don't. And so that's what we're doing. And even thinking about that on-site program, if we think about policy at Big P and Little P, what if they were incentivized to work with community programs instead of community programs being second tier? Like, oh, you have to go to that program. That shouldn't be. There should be integration of our services, but it also takes money to do that. And so we do need to incentivize that. You can start it with the little P, but we need big P policy to dictate that. So that's what we're working on. Mic drop. <laughs> that was awesome. I like what you said, though, about, about um, the big P policy, because what you're doing is so great, but it's not a, it's not a, a policy or not, it's not a, a law around that. Right. One of the things that we did launch through support from several partners was our RAISE app, which you can go into the RAISE app, enter what your needs are, and get direct support. Now, people are funding the app to give people direct support when they're in treatment, but no company in biotech will fund it for a clinical trial. You know why? because there are regulations around that. They're yeah. saying that they can't incentivize you to um, be in the trial, but they can incentivize you to take a, to be, to take, uh, they can pay for other things when you're sick, or if you're metastatic, they can't pay for you to get um, interventions to, to be able to adhere to, tr to tr a clinical trial, to be able to get the meals you need, the bills paid. And so one thing I wanna see changed with policy this next year is that you don't have to choose um, life or death because you can't eat. Because right. people, people have to choose. Do I feed my family or do I stay in my house? And you know, I was never on a clinical trial, but I had to choose at some point whether I lose my house and my car and my 401k plan or live for my daughter, who you'll see who just turned, turned 21 in, in, in a month. Why should I have to lose my home to be able to stay in treatment? And if you're in a trial, that should never be a choice. So I want to challenge our partners in the room here. How do we get over these regulatory compliance issues around giving people direct support right. in treatment. So it's policy that they're getting paid to do these things. It's not like a you have to get money for that every year, but it's part of what has to be done. Like an NCI center has to get money for Absolutely. community engagement. Yes. How can we put money in the budget to give people, to give um, patients direct support so they don't have to choose between, you know, I don't have a car, what do I do? 57% of the people who come to us are ethnically or racially diverse. What we're seeing through that clinical trial fund is that people are coming to us at later stages. The clinical trial fund is the one later that- Later stages meaning more advanced Later stages, cancers. more advanced cancer, exactly. That's who's coming to us. And the other things that we're seeing from our community partners, which is very interesting, is that they are encountering patients who are contemplating clinical trials. And so they're saying to their community, I don't know if I should do this because I can't eat. I can't do this trial and feed my family. I can't take care of medication and my rent. 
And so by working with those community partners where people feel comfortable enough to say this while they're being told you're eligible for a trial, we're able to intervene earlier to say, we can now make that possible for you. But these are real issues. No one should have to choose that, and yet people are choosing it every single day. Every single day. We've got people who are reaching out to us saying, I don't even have a place to live for my family. The, the, the social worker at the hospital suggested maybe I should, should think about tents. You know, I mean, this is this is real for people. Yeah, to live in. Particular. Yeah, this is real. There are people who I I, I literally, Mama, had a patient <laughs> who I had worked with for a while. I'd worked with her for two years. Actually, a patient who's a breast cancer survivor, and she said to me one day, "You know what? I've come in here for my treatments. I'm always put together. I'm always clean. My clothes are always in place." But what you don't know about me, because I didn't know you well enough to tell you, is that I actually don't have a home. Mm -hmm. And she went on to describe what life had been like for her throughout her entire treatment and not feeling comfortable enough to talk to us about how she was showering at the YMCA or using like the little Bunsen burner things, you know, like the little trays that you would have at a picnic to heat food or how she was using a cooler to keep things cool. I mean. Whether people are talking about it or not, this is what the so reality is. To your point, is. she trusted you to tell she you that. She did, and after some years, which yeah. we didn't love hearing, but at least we were able to build trust enough with her That's for why her to that tell us that. People that look like you and- you Absolutely. Want, because we had a similar Absolutely. thing with a patient who was actually, she, we would be on Zoom call, she would look one, well dressed, dressed, you know, mm -hmm. very well spoken, but we didn't know she was, you know, living, I think, out of her car, yeah. and she had kids. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, a black woman, you tell people you don't have, you don't have a house and you have kids, what's going to happen to you? You know, lose, you lose your kids, right? That's right. So do you That's say right. that you're homeless and, or, or do you just say, well, I'm good, you just present, well, maybe you stop treatment and then you die, right? So like, yeah. these things are happening all the time, all unless the time. you know you're in a safe space to say that I, I need help. I need help. And then that you're going to be protected when you ask for the help. Yeah. And that's why policy is so important. I love what you're doing. You know, we're talking about interventions and policy to you create models that can be sustainable and replicable, and I love what you're doing. I think that what you're doing, your work and your work, this is why all this works together, is why being a partnership, a partner is so important, because we can't all do the work. But through advocates being on Capitol Hill, through your community partnerships, through you lobbying for care, through you having the institute, through Shelby, Shelby, I keep saying Shelby. I have a friend named Shelby, so Shelby, Shelby. Um, yeah, um, but um, I just keep my day job. But, um, <laughs> And, but, and Linda, you know, you, you are such a big proponent of policy, but that's your background. You came from policy. Um, and I've been a, had the pleasure of knowing you for a number of years as a, a wonderful advocate, human, and friend. But you've always talked about why policy is important and why it's important to invest in that. And I've been to many of Amgen's health summits. You guys invest a lot of time because you talk to me a lot, and all your partners seem to be as close to you. I'm like, how'd she do that? So tell me why, how, why it's so important to you and you know, how you're helping other groups create um, mo models that can be sustainable and policy replicated and, to be, and built on over time. Definitely, well first of all, thank you so much for this. Mema, I feel a bit like a proud parent or co-parent. <laughs> you and I have been talking about policy and how Tiger Lily and you can lean in. Um, so just to skosh with my background, so I consider myself a recovering policy person. Um, I started actually interning when I was in high school at the state legislature in Colorado. Um, went on through school to work on policy and then worked on Capitol Hill. Worked for a U.S. Senator. Um, I had about enough of that. It was a great experience. Um, I think I'm a Western girl and I think the East Coast is a little too humid and a little too hot in the summer. So I then worked for the only national state level policy organization for about 22 years. So after that I realized I needed to get some private sector experience and also realized that's where the money is, right? To really enable programs, um, as my kind of initial intro said, I'm a community activist. I was raised by community activists, um, grew up in a 100% very, very low income community of color in Denver, the number one Superfund site in the United States, like in the shadow of a lead smelter plant. Um, I remember being in third grade and like our entire garden and backyard being like removed one day 
And I thought, that's really weird. So like now we have like new gardening that's coming in. Um, it's because they realized that we had the highest incidence of childhood leukemia in my neighborhood. And so they removed everybody's like soil to six inches. So growing up in the shadow of that, I realized policy is important. Um, your voice is important. And most importantly, programs and efforts like we're talking about, like my esteemed colleagues are talking about, need funding. And being an industry, that's my job. So my job is find partners who are open to it. Um, it isn't a matter of picking favorites. It's a matter of there is enough work, unfortunately, for every single advocacy group I ever meet and come across. And if I can't for my company, but mostly for myself, I mean truly that's the ethic of work, find ways to fund it to help you think about what that program should be, not tell you, you bring new programs and you have the people, you have the community connections, which are critical. Like it's the voices, it's like hearing stories like Eukarya has, Family Reach is a partner of ours. Like I, I, I think, why, why are we not partners? <laughs> yeah. but you are now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really do think, and Mamie, you were always so open to say, I want to create something. Like I would love to have more faces on Capitol Hill. Um, and when you came and said, here's what I want to do, I was like, let's do it. Like who do we need to bring to the table? But I do feel like collaboration and coalition is so important. And it shouldn't be a matter of what's my piece of the pie? It's like, let's make a bigger pie. Like there is absolutely no reason that we should be having conversations. Um, and unfortunately, we hear that a lot as well, right? And when we're thinking internally about our Safety Net Foundation and what we do for patients, we're always struck by the regulations. Like I thought I knew what regulations were like until I came to the pharmaceutical industry. And <laughs> I think, okay, <laughs> this is really what it's like to be highly regulated. Not that regulation is bad, but when it limits you from helping to make sure that patients can get care and stay in it, and that they don't have to make choices about whether to eat or feed their kids. It's like, this is you know, not just our issue, it's everybody's issue. So that's why policy for me personally is important. Um, I'm also a survivor, and I feel like going through that experience, while I would never wish that on anybody, I feel like also gives you a very different lens by which to look at the world. So when you want to support folks and how you support them, like you have to show up, right? Not just send your donation, which is great too, but to actually be there. So Mame, I know you and I've had many conversations at many a meeting, um, and if I can lend my brain, if I can't you know, fund a program, I'm always happy to do that, but the work you do is critical, and the work that all of you are doing and going to do is also critical. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. I'm just so moved by this, these women, everybody, all of you. I'm just so thankful to be in this space and be sitting here with you today. Um, you know, thank you, Linda, for making this possible, for believing in me, and you know, Elise is here, and Janine's here, Katrina's coming down, but like, to your point, you know, we have the ideas, but someone has to say, like, I believe in you, and I believe in your idea, and then it becomes real. And so, you discussing today, just clinical trials, advocacy, policy, those are all important things that are what we're all doing, but when you intervene with the policy change piece, you make that as part of the system change, that's how you create that flow down that makes health equity possible. And so I wanna close out with the patient voice, which is Valencia's. Um, if you could imagine Nirvana in policy, like what would you change, um, disrupt? What would you, what's your unicorn in the sky that you could see manifesting? I have to mention this, another organization that I am a founding member of, Mama knows what I'm about to say, the Light Collective. And several of you have talked about, and I did it too, and I still do it. I'm on social media, but I was diagnosed 2006, so it wasn't so prevalent as far as me sharing all of my breast cancer journey on social media. But what we've learned with the Light Collective is that any time you post information sharing your journey, my sister and I are survivors. My aunt died 
There is a family history. I have four children. My son will graduate from college next month. I do not want him to be denied health insurance, life insurance, or anything because of what me and my sister have shared online. And this is a critical, critical, critical piece. We started working, and I'm sorry, it'll take me two minutes. We started working on this project with funds from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They have granted us over a million dollars because what they have seen is that hospital systems are leaking data to Facebook, TikTok, everybody's trying to find out what to do when you have a double mastectomy and they're reaching out for people for support, but you gotta be very careful about what you share because then you're denied. And we've ha we have people who work with us who have been denied life insurance because it was a family history and they had to fight and they had to go to court to get that insurance. So it's very critical. And Dr. Hampton brought up AI. I was with Harvard Medical School last week and all of the brains in the room, we're talking about AI in medicine. What does that look like? My aunt, she sent me a message saying, okay, breast cancer detection with AI. They are, they're telling her, you can get this. It's just an additional set of eyes, right? You got the radiologist and then you got the AI giving what they think because we have this family history. So, but it's gonna cost her more money to get this breast imaging with AI. And what happens to that data when that whole logic system gives the information to AI? And we have to be very, very careful. I can go on and on and on, but you can go to our website, thelightcollective.org, because this is the new problem that we're having. We're having to deal with our issues, with our cancer, but then we're having to deal with our medical records. We're having to deal with all of these things that are being siphoned because we're sharing and we should share. We should have the social support because it's so important. It's important for us to connect, but we have to be mindful of all of the things that are leaking out and your hospital system, you gotta make sure. We ha we've created, last thing, a tracker. I'm gonna cut you off in a second. <laughs> I'm kidding, I can't cut her off ever. We've <laughs> created a tracking device, so Walgreens, I know you're in here. That's what we're doing. Anything that we can track to see if there's a third party tracker on your medical records, CVS, anywhere you go, we have tech people whose wives are stage four breast cancer. So everybody who works with the Light Collective is a patient. We have doctors, we have an entire team of people who are helping us because we are not in tech, but we have learned this is the new thing and there's gonna be policy around I AI. So, so yes. can, you, can you, I know we, we're out of time, but I want you to address, I asked you about what you're doing that's in Nirvana, but I think the better question is, this is a, a, a big issue, right? It the is. AI piece, because people are looking at our data, it's leaking out and the AI is growing into everything now. So. We didn't discuss that at all, but it's an important, very critical issue. As our kids are all on TikTok, yes. I'm on there all the time myself and everything else. So, <laughs> y'all know how I roll with TikTok. So, um, so tell me what you're doing in the policy space with AI, and then we'll close with that. We are coming up with rights, collective governance, right? So, it's not, it's, 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 more, it's less than the little p, just collective rights, right? What does it look like? And then we can come to pharma and say, we need you to make sure you're not putting our information out there. We're going to organizations, Walgreens and CVS and all of these people, hospital systems, to make sure that they're not, these are the rights, these are the things that we want. We have lawyers working with us with this collective governance so that we can make sure because this is the future and we have to, we gotta be thinking ahead and that's why Harvard Medical School brought the Light Collective into this conversation because we're doing the work. We're on the forefront of doing this critical work and they're listening, hopefully. Do you have a clone by the way? <laughs> I, know, I love this one, she does, she does everything. You are amazing Valencia, thank you for that closing. 
um, you all were wonderful. Um, give him a hand, please, this <laughs> panel. Thanks for all you guys do, you ladies do, and um, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get into the last panel of the day. So again, thank you all for your collective wisdom. It has illuminated this symposium with a multitude of innovative policy interventions for health equity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your insightful contributions. Each idea is a beacon of hope for a healthier and more equitable future. So now, as we transition into our second listening session titled Innovations in Risk Reduction, Health Education Versus Treating Chronic Disease, Get ready to delve into yet another dimension of thought-provoking discussion. This session promises to be a profound exploration of strategies to address the root causes of health disparity. So without further delay, let's welcome back our expert moderator, Mema, <laughs> to guide us through this session. So please again, join me in welcoming her back on stage. I was about to take off and leave you here, but we have a panel joining you. So as we uh, get started, I'm going to start calling our panelists to the stage, please. We're going to start with Shante Drakeford. Please come on up. We got her right here. Yes. Shante Drakeford, a 39-year-old Washington, D.C. native, is a foster child, former board-certified nurse practitioner, and a stage four metastatic breast cancer survivor. Glad to see you here today. She has shown unwavering resilience throughout her eight-year journey, using her unique perspective as both a patient and a provider to educate and advocate for evidence-based MBC cancer care. Shante is deeply committed to the representing the underserved community, young women and men with breast cancer, people of color, and anyone in need collaborating with various organizations and contributing to global news publications. She remains resolute in her aspiration to enjoy life to the fullest despite her diagnosis. Thank you so much, Ante, for being here today. Um, next, we have Anne Fampa. Anne, please come on up. Yes. So Anne, you heard from Anne a little bit earlier and a remarkable 31-year cancer survivor. 31 years. <laughs> thriving. This is what thriving looks like, right? Surviving and thriving. 31-year cancer survivor delves into holistic approaches after refusing chemotherapy and radiation due to multiple chemo, or excuse me, chemical sensitivity. Her wealth of information led to founding the Annie Appleseed Project an influential nonprofit dedicated to evidence-based natural cancer strategies and holistic approaches. A passionate advocate, Anne emphasizes common sense. Imagine that, just common sense, in a medical field that often loses sight of it. And she enjoys a loving marriage, family, and a legacy of impactful work in cancer advocacy. Thank you, Anne, for being here today. Next, we have Asma Dilawari. I hope I got that right. Dilawari, doctor, come on up. Thank you. <laughs> Asma, a seasoned medical oncologist with nearly 15 years of experience, transitioned to the FDA in 2022 after working at academic and community cancer centers. She hails from Memphis, Tennessee, and pursued her medical training in the Washington, D.C. area. Was that for, was that for Nashville? A, a clap, what was that? <laughs> uh, Washington, D.C. area, New York, and at Georgetown University. Dr. Dilawari's diverse exper expertise spans medical acupuncture, integrative therapies, cancer survivorship, health disparities, and supportive care, making her a valuable clinical reviewer in the FDA's Division of Oncology, where she is actively engaged in initiatives like Project Equity, I'm Project Silver. Thank you for being here today. All right, next we have Lisa Sims Booth. Come on up, Lisa Sims. 
Her journey as a patient advocate began when her mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2003, propelling her into a mission to improve the experience for families facing similar challenges. She has held key roles in organizations such as the Biden Cancer Initiative, leading collaborative efforts and patient navigation initiatives. Today, as the executive director of the Smith Center for Healing and the Arts, she continues to advocate for cancer patients and their families by providing holistic and innovative health services rooted in the belief that everyone has the innate ability to heal regardless of life's challenges. Mema, the floor is yours. Let's do this. Um, thank you for being here, ladies. I'm so good to see all of you and Anne. You have been, for me, an inspiration in terms of integrative health and, and really has impacted my breast cancer journey. Um, I'll start with Shantae, but the reason why we have this panel is that I know that many of us hear about treating disease, but we don't hear a lot about risk reduction or how to even stay healthy. People don't pay for you to stay healthy, they pay for you to get treated, which is wonderful to help survive cancer and other diseases, but how do we invest more in people not getting sick or not getting sick as chronically? Or even when you are through that cancer diagnosis, how do you just get your body back together to be a, a machine that can stave off disease for you? And I know that when after my diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer and I rang the bell, I got in the car and I cried for an hour because no one's gonna be treating my cancer anymore. It was triple negative breast cancer, which had no targeted treatment. So what was I gonna do? And so for me, not having anything to fight the cancer in any way that was targeted, I was looking for ways to stay alive. And I ended up finding um, Anne's conference and I went to it. And it really changed how I began to understand what I could do on my part to support the medical interventions, which was you know, getting involved with like things like spirulina, matcha, yoga, reiki, my diet, nutrition, everything that I learned from you. So I know we don't talk much, but thank you for being um, a, a pioneer in this space for doing this for so many years for many of us. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with Shantae. Um, your story, well, you know how much I love you, so that goes without saying. But your story just, whenever I hear it, I just get, it, you inspire me, but I get, I get um, it angers me because um, of the things that you knew ahead of time about your body, you were your best advocate, did all the right things, and yet because of the healthcare system, you ended up, now you, you're living with um, stage four breast cancer. But your, your perspective on life is changing how people see patients who are metastatic. You're not saying, well, poor me, you're saying, well, I gotta live. And you're living a life where you are a nurse, um, you're an, an advocate, you're a farmer, um, and you're, you're, um, I believe that your lifestyle can really impact how you live life in a way that's holistic and it's empowering. So please share with our guests your story, what happened with you, and, and how you're turning that around to live a healthier lifestyle in, in a 360 way. All right, hi everybody. Hi, Shantae. <laughs> All right, so just like Mama said, um, my journey is a little bit different. Um, I started at the age of 25. At that time, I was living in Alaska. My husband was in Iraq, just coming from a tour, because um, he's in the Army. And at that time, I was a registered nurse. I started having nipple discharge. Um, at that time, it wasn't bloody. I went immediately to go get seen, because I'm not afraid to catch anything to see if anything's wrong. Um, and I understand the importance of it because I was a medical provider at the time. And when I was seen, I was just told countless of times, oh, you're fine, nothing to worry about, you don't need a mammogram, you're young. And at that time I didn't have any cysts, but I was told I had fibrocystic breasts and the nipple discharge was normal um, as long as it doesn't turn bloody. Okay, so two years went by, I trusted my providers, you know, and I was told this by multiple ones, and I used to move around, and consistently for six years, I was told there's nothing wrong. Two years went by, it went bloody, and I go back in, and now I have a palpable cyst that you can feel, and I was told, okay, so now it's bloody, let's just take the breast duct out. I had the surgery to remove it, and I asked them, 
because they drain that cyst, possibly biopsy it, you know, just to kind of see if there's anything going on, and it's also causing me a lot of pain. That wasn't done. I woke up, the cyst was still there, rather large by um, this time. My husband and I was going through infertility treatments for five years. I am triple positive, um, so I'm sure that had a little bit to do with it. But when I finally went to go see a doctor again, this time that cyst turned hard, very hard, like a rock. Um, my breast was retracting, my nipples was inverting, and the first time I went to see that provider, they told me, oh, it's just scar tissue from your surgery. Just take some even print rolls, you'll be fine. There's nothing to be a worry, you know, nothing to worry about. I even went to a mammogram appointment one time and was turned around and said, nope, you don't need it. You're really fine. And recently I went through all of my documentation of my medical history, just kind of see if there's anything I did wrong, because I still kind of blame myself, but it's not really my fault. I understand that now. But um, it even documented, you know, there's no risk factors for this patient that needs, to, there's nothing to be done. I should have been offered a high risk screening um, every six months, but I wasn't. So when I went back again and the tumor was just still hard, uh, that's when I was taken seriously. I got an MRI, I had an ultrasound, I had a mammogram. During that day, I was on the table getting everything done. I wasn't nervous. I was just like, it's probably another benign condition. And also at that time, I was having hip pain, I was having back pain, I had a cough, I thought it was allergies and things like that. And they told me, um, yeah, based on the imagery, you know, looks like you have cancer. And I'm like, starting to freak out. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, is it bad? You know, and they say, yeah, and also you have a lymph node involvement. And they, luckily, because this isn't offered to everyone, they scanned my whole body. They gave me a bone scan and a CT scan. And from that time frame, I was scheduled to get my port because I was going to get the traditional chemo, mastectomy, radiation. They stopped me. And I'm starting to get concerned. I went in to see my doctor, and all I heard was stage four, womp, 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 womp. And you know, I'm a patient, even though I'm a provider, like as a patient, that's, it's just kind of going one ear out the other. So I was terrified. And they told me that the cancer spread to my lungs, multiple spots in my spine, a uh, huge tumor in my left hip, and um, you know, my ribs. And so it was just kind of like daunting to hear that. And then instantly you think of death, right? And so. After like I was calmed down a few times and I just was just in shock. I kind of pulled myself together because I've been through a lot of stuff. I'm a foster kid. I grew up in DC, poor. I have um, you know substance abuse parents. I beat all those statistical odds and I'm gonna do this. Yes. 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 And I've been living with this for eight years now. Um, still stable, haven't progressed, thank God. And I started my advocacy journey with Tiger Lily. And it's a lot of things that I'm kind of non-conventional about, so you might hear those things today, because I really am about change. Can you share a bit about, because we're the last panel, we have to be out of the room to shift, but I want you, I want you to share what you're doing with your life now, okay. in terms of risk, with, like how you're living your life in a way that, I know, I know when we talked, you said there's things if you knew differently, before that there were risks, you would have done different, but you didn't know what you didn't know, you did the right. best you could. You did all the right things. Yeah. So what are things that you would, um, just in one minute, because I'm under pressure here, Sorry. for the Oscar police are gonna come with that, you know, the, the, <laughs> with the, with the, the, the um, thing and pull my neck and the music and all that. So what are, what are the things you wish you knew to lower your risk of becoming metastatic? If you could have, I mean, of being diagnosed earlier stage, because you can't right. determine what stage you're going to be diagnosed at. What do you wish you knew earlier, and then what, would, what are you doing now with your life, like with the farming, and right. how you live your life to, that, that's helping you, you think? Well, you know, I really don't know what I really wish I would have known. I just would have wished that my providers took me seriously and just kind of took heed to what I was asking and telling them and giving me the diagnostic studies. I can't do nothing about it, but um, my doctors and um, providers are excellent now. They're like my family. We're very, we have a very close relationship. I am really big on enjoying life. Like, I am not the one that sit there and dwell on it. You know, I cannot control this, unfortunately. 
So my husband always told me this big thing, you know, you gotta reinvent yourself, you know. I still work as a nurse practitioner in primary care, just once a week because I ca obviously can't do it more. But I am also helping my people, my young patients. I like to live healthy, I'm very active. I was like that before cancer. I'm gonna always be that way. I pivot and modify my lifestyle. I have a farm where I go like organic products and I also give and um, my products to the community. I accept snaps so they could buy fresh produce. I work out as much as I can. I used to snowboard, but I, you know, I can't do that anymore, but it's okay. I always preach do as much as you can until you can't because I know it'll be a moment where I can't do nothing. I won't be able to sit up here and talk to you. I won't be able to walk. I won't be able to do all these things, but until I can, I'm just gonna, you know, until I can't in that moment, I'm gonna still keep living and keep advocating. Thank you, my love. I love this woman. She has the best farm, food, food from her farm. I, she comes to my house every, like, every couple months and I'm like, bring the food. She brings <laughs> eggs and spices and I'm just like, just we make eggs and eat them. It's just, we, we have the best time. And I just love how you um, to turn your scars into stars. You inspire me all the time. And um, even when I get scared, I'm like, I have a bone pain. I'm like, she's like, calm down, you're fine. Just go get, go sh get some stretching done or something. You don't have metastasis, you just stop it. <laughs> you know, like, but she's such a good uh, friend and an influencer. And in terms of like her attitude, it inspires so many people, even myself. So thank you, Shante. Um, so I know we, we have, I think Shante said like 10 minutes, so I'm trying to try to go faster. Lisa, how are you helping patients um, integrate holistic lifestyle practices before, during, and after cancer? And how are you seeing that transform their cancer journey? Such a great question. And thank you all. Thank you for having me here today. You know, the Smith Center is really focused on thinking about the whole person. And I think as people talked about earlier today, it's often that you're, you're, they're only seeing you in your physical state and you have cancer and so you are a file, you're, you're a case number or what have you. But we need to think about the entire person, their mental, emotional, psychosocial well-being. And that's something that Smith Center is focused on. We focus on healing. And we don't mean curing, we mean how do we get you back to wholeness? Because wholeness is gonna help you through the journey. And the wholeness is gonna help you be able to rally in this most challenging time of your life. And so we offer all kinds of support. It's the things that we know we all need. And that is community, which people have talked about earlier, which is why we offer our support groups and healing circles and opportunities to be with people. But we also then think about creativity. And um, you know, so because we know that the art is a real powerful tool for healing. We have people who've gone through our programs who've gone on to write books and become artists themselves and do poetry and tap into this whole new part of themselves. And so they're no longer um, someone who, they're now an artist and they see themselves in a different way and that is really powerful. You know, but the main things, and then it's, it's things that we're, I know you're gonna talk about as well, um, Anne, and that's better nutrition, moving your body, but also finding a spiritual space, whatever that is, if it's walking in nature, but meditating, you have to take care of all of you so when you're walking through this time, you can manage your way through. And that's why I'm really proud to be a part of the organization. We're the only independent nonprofit in DC that offers this kind of holistic, whole person care. You know, people need to know that there are, these options are available, and a lot of people don't know that these integrative approaches are there. But the most important thing is we can't ignore what's happening to your to your emotional well-being when you're going through this. And I think a lot of times that kind of gets, you know, under the rug. Like, are you, are you making your appointments? Are you going to your chemo? Yes, okay. But I'm terrified. My family's terrified. Who do I talk to? And that's why it's so important to have that community. We also offer patient navigation, which others have talked about. And we have an integrative approach. So we bring all that together. And so really, this is a way people don't have to go through this journey alone. And having a community partner in addition to your medical team, is a great way to approach that and get through that time. I love that. And I go there, okay? And I have support too. Group. I love it, I love, I love, I love, it's beautiful. I mean, I haven't been there for a long time, but it's beautiful. I'm glad you go there. I was gonna say, one of my friends who's, um, she's very spiritual, she does Reiki, she creates, makes crystals and I'm on to all that stuff. She totally helped me to see another way of looking at cancer. And I, I think of things differently. I'm, in, I'm a yogi, I meditate, do yoga, crystals, cards, all that stuff, total hippie. Um, but she was saying that when she got cancer diagnosis, 
and made her love her body more. She made, made her realize her body was working for her in so many ways before they took for granted, that she could get out of bed and look at her fingers, and she, it, it, she could move, and she could get up and stand erect and walk and go to the bathroom and, and just, oh, I want to wash my face and open the tap. And I've always been very thoughtful about that. But she was saying that her body, when it was going through chemo and going through all the changes, was actually fighting for its life for her. It was working even harder to keep her here. So I think in cancer, we have this, I'm going to attack, my body's betraying me. But she's made it where she helped me to see that your body's now working harder than ever to help you. How do you honor your body? So she began to do something. We began to talk together. We talked a lot about talking about how we're going to have to bless our body as it is healing us. So bless it with, as you're get, getting the chemo, bless whatever is doing to your body. As you're getting the radiation, bless what ha whatever is happening. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. But when you bless your body and you bless what it's doing to protect you in certain ways, your perspective shifts in as you're going through that journey. Um, and she said she, she had been um, uh, an alcoholic at some point and some, before that drugs, and she always hated her body. When she realized she spent over 50 years hating her body that was now saying to, that she could now lose her life, the love for her body became so acute and poignant in that time that she was like, I really, she cried about how she had not seen herself and how it worked for her. And her entire lifestyle shifted to how she is living, thinking, eating, resting, all the things that you and Ann teach. She's doing that now, but she learned that because she had to shift during her cancer journey. So thank you for all that you do to help people like her wake up because we, as women, we, we were so hard on ourselves. I want to fix this. Like I have this little pocket here, a little back fat there, my nose, my ears, my eyes, whatever. It's like, give your body a break. And then and with cancer, what you guys do is you say, how can I heal my body with the medication, but also to make it stronger and to honor it with the mind, body, spirit alignment. And so, Anne, um, you know, I met you at the conference that you have um, at Annie Appleseed, and it was just amazing how you've been helping people who have different diseases, and especially with cancer, navigate life by doing things that are free, kind of, sometimes, or low cost, but things they could do to keep their bodies healthier longer and help them to heal. Can you share a bit about what you do at Annie Appleseed? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say I was... You know, I mentioned I was diagnosed 31 years ago. At that time, nutrition was alternative medicine. Physical activity was alternative medicine. And the oncologist I consulted told me that yoga would kill me. So we have come some distance since then. But the, the, you know, there's a lot, a lot more that we have to do. Uh, so I founded the organization because I was in a support group and I was healthy and everyone else was getting sick from conventional treatment. And I realized uh, that well, they realized, people said to me, you know, can we try the juice that you're making? Can we take a walk with you? What supplements are you taking? And some very brave women began to incorporate those things into their regimen, and they felt healthier, and we had each other to compare to, so we could see that some of the people were doing better. And uh, I formed the concept that if it helps to reduce your risk, it also helps to reduce the risk of recurrence, and I believe that to be true. I've had a lot of recurrences, and I didn't die. I am probably the tumor queen of North America. I've literally had, I'm not joking, I had nine tumors in the breast and 14 on the chest wall before after mastectomy, total of 25 tumors. Can anybody match that? And yet I didn't die. In 97, they told me I was stage four. All of those things, I told the doctor, I'm not sure who you're talking to, it's not me. And that was my mindset. And you know, I urge everyone to ignore any kind of, anything they tell you about, oh, it's not good, it's not good, it's not true. It's not about you, it's about the statistics. They don't know about you, we know about each other, we know about ourselves, and we have to take that to heart and say, yeah, it's not about me personally. And I always believe that, it's not me personally. It's the group, unfortunately, for the group. Okay, so the other thing that I do, aside from sharing information very widely, through our website, our YouTube channel, which has videos of past conference speakers and presenters, but also, I go to mainstream meetings, and I, I I consider myself a critic, and I'm actually known as a, a critic and an advocate critic, and I stand up all the time and, and ding. First ding was, oh, the patient failed the treatment, and I said, not, oh, nope, nobody ever failed anything. Your treatment didn't work. It has nothing to do with us, you know? Or if somebody says, oh, my doctor told me I only have three months to live. Uh, you know, I would like to curse, but I'm not going to curse in public, but the fact is that's complete nonsense. No one can tell you that especially a lot of religious people here. You know that no doctor can tell you. They don't know you. They can't tell you that. It's complete nonsense. That's statistics also, not personal. 
And I've had even people tell me, I got a year to live, you know? Oh boy, that's even crazier, you know? So disregard that. Now I was diagnosed with lymphoma five years ago and the doc kept saying, you know, you're not in remission. Every time we met, she'd say, you're not in remission. I said, doc, I understand that. The greeting should be, Anne, how are you? You're looking so well, how do you feel? <laughs> And I tell her, I feel great, thank you very much, you know? And, and that's what all of us should go with. Find your joy, find your passion. My passion is definitely advocacy, as so many of us here have, and it makes such a difference. I mean, I know it's like keeping me afloat. There's not a question in my mind. I was recently in Germany at the World Congress on Integrative Oncology, and a doctor said, oh, patient failed the treatment. <laughs> Stopped right there. But we also talked about the maximum tolerated dose. We're not lab animals. We should not be getting the maximum anything. It should be a personalized dose. The, the treatment has to f catch up with us. We need a personal dose, clearly and obviously. Another thing that came up was something I, I heard years ago, my first FDA meeting in 1995, and uh, they said <laughs> there were no unexpected toxicities from this treatment, and I said, how do you know? Unexpected and none, you can't put that in the same sentence, you know what I mean? So these are the things that I talk about publicly. A presenter says, this treatment was blah, 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 fantastic, this did this, that. And I say, okay, but we'd like to know what the harms are because we the people are gonna be taking that drug and we wanna know how it's gonna be. And if you can't tell us, then you haven't done your job. We need to know. The other thing that I really think is important, I'm sorry, I'm rushing because I really wanna say this, clinical trial. So I hand it out to some of you and I'd love to give all of you our pamphlet on reducing treatment toxicity. Because you shouldn't have to stop your treatment because of the toxicity when there are things that you can do to reduce, reduce that and you can go on with the treatment. We need to, treatment helps us, we know that, there's no question. Um, I mean, I know I stand out because I didn't do it, but I couldn't, believe me, I was sick, I couldn't do it. So there's a lot of things that can change in the way our system is set up, not the least of which is that insurance does not cover uh, paying for yoga if you have to, paying for, for nutrition, which it should right off the bat. Um, another thing is, in supermarkets, we should have a sign in front of every fruit and every vegetable that says what they would have been sprayed with. So when you look at it, you can say to yourself, well, I can either eat five pesticides or I could have the organic. They're saying it's more expensive, it shouldn't be, because these people put a lot of effort into spraying this fruit with the wrong stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I mean, she put us to school. I, I, that was awesome, man. You got All it done. Facts. We gotta, we gotta have you back for something. <laughs> I love it. I, I do. I mean, I, I'm done. No words. Nothing funny to say. You just, you just hit every point. Yeah. Can I just jump in just to say, based on what you said, and you're absolutely right about the non-insurance covering those things. That's why Smith Center offers those things for free, because we don't want money to be the barrier to get access to those supportive services. So I just wanted to share that because we need to address that from the insurance realm, but that's, but that's why community partners and I know Taiba really offers those same programs. Money you shouldn't do. be a barrier to get to those kind of integrative approaches. But it is a challenge though because even like when I began to, I went to Anne's conference and began to experiment with like, you know, fasting and, you know, juicing and supplements, those things are not inexpensive. And so I had to really like look at, you know, I saw one of Keisha's post about less Amazon and more of the other thing, like, because you like, how do I save my life or keep myself here? But because I have to buy these things, but they're not inexpensive. There are books I had to learn to read. I'm reading right now, Dave Asprey. He's, he's the guy who talks about the, what's it called? Superhuman. He talks about how to like keep your body clean and how to per keep, you know, just what to put in your body. Rest, sleeping is a big thing. People don't know about sleep and how it can help you to live longer. It can, it can um, help the risk reduce for dementia, Alzheimer's, your heart, heart disease. So pretty much our environment is set up for industrialization. So we have more of whatever product and we have ease of living, but that ease of living can cause our death. And so the more people are aware of, you know, taking the right medication is important, following recommendations are important, but being aware of what you're putting in your body, on your body, what you're inhaling, it's a lot of money and time. So a lot of the time I spent, like you guys, I, it's like, how do I know what I'm doing around me to be able to not die? Um, so just, you know, for patients too, we have to be talking about the importance of complementary medicine, like alternative medication, you know, uh, you know, juicing, acupuncture, all those things, plus being in treatment, because they, 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 they go together. So I'll let you talk, and I'm gonna ask the FDA what they're gonna do about all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I like, just, oh, damn, why am I here? <laughs> I just wanted to bring a point because I just think that this is hardly ever kind of brought up. 
um, is always kind of look in these rooms at you know, conferences and things like that. There's never a representative from insurance companies. Yes. They need to be here. They need to hear these discussions. They need to come here and give us tips on how to get claims covered because that, that is a really big barrier, financial toxicity. But not once have I seen representatives from any insurance agency that comes and just listen because if they can listen and learn, they can also change. You know, so I just think that we need to kind of keep leading that and putting an emphasis on that and inviting them and just kind of have them in the room to hear the patient perspective, to hear the provider perspective, because it's not always the provider. It ain't always the patient. Sometimes it's the insurance. Yeah, they were, yes. And they do, they do hide from us. I've been doing this for a long time and I rarely see people in the room. And when we invite them, they don't show up. You have to kind of figure out how to, we can figure out how to trick them into the room. We'll figure this out next year. <laughs> okay, so Asma, can you share a bit about the FDA? Because we're talking about, you know, um, holistic health and alternative medications and treatments, yeah. and the FDA does things differently. <laughs> how, do you see, how do you see some of this tying into what we could do to ensure that people are getting access and that things that, to your point, that exercise people thought wasn't going to be, a, you know, a best practice mm -hmm. or eating healthy, but now we know that there's, those are great interventions for people who have cancer during in or after cancer. So how can the FDA play into some of this yeah, becoming more? I, I think, um, so FDA is a federal agency that works for Congress, so good and bad. I, I'll, I'll let you guys form your opinions on that. Um, we, you know, we are kind of bound to what policies get passed. We don't make the policy. However, all of us are, most of us in, in oncology at the FDA are oncologists, so we all feel very strongly about some of the same things. And I, I just want to speak to what Annie brought up about a maximum tolerated dose. These are the kind of things the FDA can work on. And we have a whole project called Project Optimus that is reevaluating the dosage approach to clinical trials. That is hopefully, oh, and Shante was there too. Awesome. So I, I think we've had like a lot of discussion about this and that kind of brings me to what I think the FDA can do. And you know, I, it sounds weird to say a, a, you know, an agency that's main job is drug approval, drug approval, drug approval, therapy, therapy, therapy is motivated here, um, but we are. We've heard from our patient advocates, we've heard from the community and our job is to serve the public. So. You know, Rich Pazder, my boss at Oncology Center of Excellence, we have several public health initiatives that are geared just to get patient voices into the clinical trial research. Um, you know, not leaving that voice out of it. And what's, what's come out of that, one of the biggest things is Project Equity, which is um, a, a whole initiative uh, kind of designed to hold drug manufacturers accountable for having patients in their clinical trials that look like the patients in the U.S. that will be taking these therapies. And I hate to say it, but we're in 2023 and I've reviewed several applications where we have 6% of the patient population is black women and it's a breast cancer trial. And I'm talking, breast cancer trials are, are hundreds of patients. So you know, we can't do that anymore. And I know some of those trials started, what, eight years ago? But eight years ago, that wasn't, that's not that long ago, you know? And uh, things should be different. So um, the, the, you know, the new uh, federal, the Food and Drug Omnibus Act gave uh, the FDA a little more flexibility on what we can hold, uh, you know, drug manufacturers accountable for. And part of that is you kind of have to have the diversity plan. You have to submit it to us early, especially before you have a registration trial. And then you have to have steps along the way, like if you're not enrolling an adequate number of patients, what are you gonna do about it? And one of the biggest things I've seen in the diversity plans that have come in for the breast cancer group are collaborations with community. So they don't work unless they are talking to patient advocacy groups, talking to Tiger Lily, talking to a lot of great organizations in DC, but all across the country on what are we doing wrong? Where do we need to open our trial? And that issue is so big, we could probably talk about it for eight hours, but I think we've also heard from patients that trials aren't designed pragmatically. Like they're just not practical for patients. I mean, patients can't come back three times in one week for, for blood draws. So we're, we have a project Pragmatica. How do we redesign clinical trials so they're approachable for every patient? And then one thing I just definitely wanna mention is from the last panel, there was 
a big um, discussion about payment, and there is absolutely nothing holding, uh, preventing drug companies from including um, payments to patients on their clinical trials. There isn't. That's a myth, and um, you know it needs to be out there because we can't make them do it, <laughs> but we point it out. We point out like diff you know. Patients are complaining about transportation. They don't have time to pay for parking three times. You know, you kind of have to incorporate that. And I, I haven't seen a lot of resistance, but it really needs to show up in the trial design, you know? Like, and so we're trying to do more of this project community, project equity, and hearing patient voices. Um, so I'll stop there, because I know people have questions. I just have a question about the question about the I know this isn't something that the FDA can do, but it's something that the IRS can do. And my understanding is that if a patient's in a clinical trial, any amount of money that they get from a sponsor or anybody that has to do with, with, with out-of-pocket costs in a clinical trial above $600 a year has to count as income, and they need to get a 1099, and now they have to pay taxes on it. And it seems unreasonable for having to be in a trial, you need to think about where probably you lost your job or now you're part-time and you're in a clin clinical trial to have to pay taxes on money yeah. above $600. So who could we work with at the IRS to change that? Well, I, I can't speak to who at the IRS can change that, but I will say there are creative ways around that. Like the way um, trial payments are designed, they don't always have to have that you know direct payment to the to patients, but some of the services they provide could go into a different setup and eventually, you know, accomplish the same thing. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. I agree with you, that shouldn't happen. Um, but I think those are the, the kind of things that need to be brought up in the public forum because, you know, some of the things like Annie mentioned about dosage, about equity, the only reason we're talking about it after this long is because patients spoke up. So I, they don't listen to us, they, they will listen to patients. And also, if people aren't getting clinical trials with accruals and patients aren't signing up, they're not gonna get their drug approved. You know, if we have a, a tiny sample size and your trial didn't accrue, your drug's gonna fail. And that will incentivize people, I think, also to, to um, do what is the right thing. Thank you. Um, this has been a really enlightening conversation. I just wonder if there's ways to and we're, we're out of time, but like, if there's ways to even integrate, you know, alternative medicine and things like that into, you know, when you get your treatment, that's offered to you as a part of your, your um, treatment journey. So you have access to the nutrition that your body needs, to the mental, physical, spiritual, you know, like soul-based food you need. There's, there's food food and there's the in, internal stuff. And also like, um, a lot of things I learned about at your conference and the things that you should be eating, those things are pretty expensive. So if you're living in a, a rural, a, I'm sorry, urban area, you, you won't have access to maybe a health, you know, healthy food garden or all you see is Popeye's liquor store or hair salon. You don't see, you know, freaking Harris Teeter or a market. And so it's like, for people who are black and brown, that inhibits us from having, even if we want to, to have those things, right? So even if you desire them, the, the redlining that occurs due to racism is still blocking you from getting equitable access to saving your life through having healthy interventions. So a, a lot of it's again back to what we talked about earlier, it's policy change. Because you know, if you don't change policy, you can't change the fact that you can't cover certain, even yoga or therapy or things like that, and even having a community that has to ha be rezoned to have places where you can have you know, more, more um, you know, even like gyms, out, like basketball courts, or having you know, better foods in your community. So I think that those things could be potentially, you know, policy changes as well as Jeannie's question because we have this platform called Raise. We talked to all these companies about can you fund, can, can you put the money for the trial um, interventions into your budget so people have, can get into the budget going, into the trial going, okay, I'm gonna be safe throughout this process. I'll have my needs met and everybody's like, no, we can't. Um, we can't be the first to do it. Let someone else do it first and we'll do it after you. And then we had some calls where I, got, I was crying on a call with the sponsor. They said, we can't fund this. And I'm like, people are dying. You can do it. And then she says, they can do it. FDA 
it just says we can do it. Right, so we gotta figure out the IRS piece, then we're good, Jamie. Okay. <laughs> um, but it, this has been a really amazing uh, day. I feel so inspired by all these amazing, wonderful speakers. Um, one minute, yes. I just want to let you know, our organization's having our 16th conference the end of February next year. If you go to our website, annieappleseedproject.org, you can see what's going on. And I hope many of you will attend. We have a lot of scholarships available this year for next year. Please apply. <laughs> I love hands. Um, but thank you for coming. It's been a privilege to be your, your, your moderator, and thanks for trusting me with your, with your, your um, personas, your stories all of you for being here the whole day from eight o'clock until three o'clock. Um, so I'll have Kim come and help us close and then um, we can go relax and get ready for Empower. Get ready to dance, oh, pictures first, then get dolled up, dolled up, dancing and having fun tonight. Um, thank you all so much. Hi guys. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> drop it, drop it, drop it.